All right, this is Jeff Nyquist and another edition of Friends and Enemies. And we covered World War I last week. We're going to cover the first half of World War II this week because uh, it's so much to cover. We're going to cover two sides. We're going to cover the espionage of it. My pet peeve about World War II history is that many Western historians and their histories just accept Soviet historical accounts of World War II, of the battles on the Eastern Front, where the Soviets actually leave uh, big things out, battles that the Soviets lost. Uh, they exaggerate, uh, you know, battles. They create battles that really weren't big battles, like the Battle of Moscow in late 41 was not the big battle the Soviets claimed it was. Uh, so it, it, it's, um, it's a curious history because, of course, people want to falsify history. A lot of people say the victors write the history. Well, that's not even true. That's another one of my pet peeves because you go back to the Peloponnesian War. Uh, actually, Thucydides, the great historian of the Peloponnesian War, was not a Spartan; he was an Athenian. So the victor didn't write the history; the vanquished wrote the history, uh, and he wrote it fairly objectively. But so it's not always true that the victors. Sometimes it is, and in the case of World War II, of course, this is really the case with the Russians. So we have to be very careful in trying to understand the war because the Russians are covering up the fact that they started the war as Hitler's partners and that they fell out. And that's a big part of the story. The way this partnership ended up causing the war, really. So um, maybe, Alex, you want to start talking about the different powers that existed at the time and how it was sort of a three-way struggle. Exactly. So, well, what annoys me about his um, history um you know, the books that have been written about the war. Um, mainly, it's for me, it's uh, avoiding the, t the, the intelligence uh, sphere. Um, so we got some information about um, the British SOE, the Special Operations Executive, and uh, this has been turned into even television documentaries and movies and all that. Uh, so when you had these commandos that were half soldiers, half spies, and they were parachuted into occupied France and they, they uh, linked up with the French resistance and so on and so forth, that was it's an interesting chapter uh, when it comes to intelligence, but it's just a fraction of the overall picture. And the other thing that we got, I think decades later, uh, was Bletchley Park the British code-breaking unit that made this big machine so they could decrypt um, the Nazi communications uh, that were encrypted with these handy-dandy little Enigma uh, machines. But there's, yeah, also, a, a, there's also another layer to this. There's also another layer to this Enigma thing yeah, that I... And, that and I, I should add that uh, when people celebrate this, and it was sort of kept secret even a little bit after the war, the Enigma secret... Enigma was the German cipher machine code system. Um, the Germans also broke the Allied code. And not only that, the Germans were able to tap into the transatlantic telephone cable line, and they actually were able to listen in to some of the phone conversations between Churchill and Roosevelt. And this, of course, is related, I think, by Walter Schellenberg um, talks about some of that. So at different times, the Germans could read the the British and the British could read the Germans and then like you say they made movies out of celebrating a lot of the Allied intelligence triumphs um, the the and of course the Germans well the Germans didn't have a lot of intelligence triumphs because the the head of the Abwehr um, Admiral Canaris was really very sympathetic to the Allies and he mm. didn't like Hitler uh, and he tried to undermine Hitler. Um, yeah. But at the same time, he was against the communists and he didn't want the Soviet Union to win the war. So, and this is where uh, uh, Philby, Kim Philby, the British, the British actually suspected Philby might not be right, but they gave him access to intelligence. They actually gave him access to their suspicions that Canaris might be helping them. Canaris didn't openly come to the British and say, I'm helping you, that we know of, although there might have been a secret meeting between him and C in Spain. Uh, I think, what, in 1941, maybe? Um, I've got the book right here, and I, I, I read two books on Canaris last year. But, but um, Canaris, uh, as far as we know, 
he actually stopped Sea Lion. He uh, convinced the German Navy and Army that there were twice as many active British divisions uh, ready to oppose an invasion than there were. And that if they had known the real numbers, and, and Canaris had given them the right numbers in Norway, in Poland, in France, but until so they trusted him because his information had been very good up until then, he falsified the data on, on sea line. And, yeah. you know, Hitler, a lot of the German generals like Keitel said, oh, it was disaster, sea line would have never worked. But in, and of course, uh, Admiral Rader in his biography said, you know, this wasn't going to work. But, um, but actually, given if they had known there were half as many divisions in what actual state they were in, uh, because the British Army left all of its equipment on the beach at Dunkirk, um, they might have gone ahead and done it. And that might have been good or bad for either side, yeah. because we don't know what would have happened then. Yeah, we also got, um, yeah, we also got some material on the the backroom negotiations, the secret back channels, um, when German generals um, and others, uh, and of course the as you mentioned, um, these intelligence uh, intelligence people like Canaris, Oster, and all the others, they um, they tried to negotiate with the British um, behind Hitler's back. Then he figure find, found out about it then he kind of let it let it continue for a while um there were also secret negotiations with the americans and so th this is sort of what we got um or what what historians have been focusing on but i think that the overall picture here is what really uh what is, is, is really the most important uh and that's the penetration the intelligence penetration of germany of Britain and the United States. So, because if, if we look at if we look at the 1920s and the 1930s, the time before the war, um, there were some some uh, outrageous outrageous intelligence disasters um, in the West. And so, this is sort of where the the communists were able to shine, you know, in the intelligence front. And so, we're going to mm -hmm. look at we're going to look at these different um, countries before the war, where they were at, what their intentions were, and also what the penetration uh, was and how that played out. So, um, maybe we, let's start with the the United States. Now, of course, um, the uh, the entry into World War One was um, was absolutely key and and Germans had underestimated the Americans and the Americans they they sent over two million soldiers in 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 a very uh, short amount of amount of time the Americans had also produced tens of thousands of uh, four-wheel drive trucks that were used by various countries in the war um, and so then after World War one uh, America sort of went back to the uh, the position of not interfering and and just uh, focusing on domestic issues. Just like you know, some people today say, uh, "Why should we care about Ukraine? Why should we get involved? You shouldn't. Why should we get involved in Europe at all? Why shouldn't we let Russia do what it wants to do in Europe? This does not concern America." So this was sort of a a discussion back then in the United States. Now, of course, um, America's America's economy, um, America's economy was becoming so much stronger in the 1920s and 30s. Um, the new inventions, the new improved engines that were later used in uh, in airplanes, the the superchargers, and and all that stuff that became important. So, um, what what do you think about what do you think about that? Some call it isolationism um, that was going on in the 1920s and 30s um, in regards well, to should, America. Uh, I, I should talk about American diplomatic history, and it it uh, really starts with George Washington. It, it, if you remember, George, you know we had the the constant the new Constitution, and George Washington became president in 1789, and you had the um, the new Constitution come into effect, and uh, you had the French Revolution which started in 1789. And um, the French Revolution was um, uh, a battle in which the, uh, the French, who had been our allies in the American Revolution, had this revolution of their own, which initially 
had some of the same ideas of liberty that the American Revolution had. And of course, the American Revolution was split between sort of, you could say, conservatives and and more liberal, you know, because really conservatives started out, I mean, the it, it, yeah. people say that Edmund Burke was the founder of, of Anglo-Saxon conservatism. He was a Rockingham Whig. The Whig Party was basically the liberal party of its day. They believed in you know, you know, freedom. They believed in, in they had ideals of liberty and uh, open commerce. You know, they believed in capitalism. And uh, he was a Rockingham Whig, and he had basically warned in the, that the American Revolution, uh, the Americans had a point that Britain was double taxing the Americans, controlling their trade and taxing them, which was just crushing them. And he said, they, you, you, this is the best part of the British Empire, you don't want to lose this. Mm. But what happened is that, so the Americans had two sides, and in the you had the, um, the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists. And the, the Anti-Federalists became the Democratic Republican Party, it was called at the time. We call it the Democratic Party, now a party of Jefferson. It ended up being, and um, to, to understand this division, George Washington, the, the big problem was part, half of America supported the French Revolution. The other half thought the French Revolution was different than the American Revolution. It was dangerous. The Jacobinism was dangerous, that it wasn't really freedom, and that it had more sympathy with views like Burke's. And Washington and Adams and Alexander Hamilton were of that group. Jefferson was not. That's why Jefferson ended up leaving the Washington administration. So this, this, this problem this these wars which became you know the wars of revolution the the coalition wars against the french republic there were americans who wanted to be on the side of france and there were uh, americans of course who wanted to stay out and that was the party of washington they said we want to we don't want to get involved in europe's business we've got this country over here it's developing it's new we can't afford to be involved in europe's quarrels so when George Washington left office, and of course, you had, you know, when Adams was president, you had the XYZ affair where America almost went to war with France during the Adams administration. So you had this, this real pull to pull America in. And of course, the British were, you know, putting on this blockade where they were boarding American merchantmen and they were seizing the crews and, in, and actually pressing them into service in the British fleet. It's terrible things going on. And it was very difficult for all the American presidents, Washington, Adams, and Jefferson, to keep America out of the wars in Europe during the Napoleon. Of course, we ended up in 1812 being in that war. We did ultimately get dragged in. But Washington said very clearly in his farewell address that America should have no foreign entanglements. We should not become involved. We need to grow and build. We have a whole continent we need to concentrate on. And this is John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, said similar things. He actually came up, he was uh, Secretary of State under President Monroe. The Monroe Doctrine really was formulated by uh, Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, who later had one term as president himself. And so this was, and of course, John Quincy Adams, I think, is the one that enunciated that we have sympathy for, you know, freedom everywhere, but we are not going to you know fight for it it's not our obligation to fight wars for it so this was deeply held in american um foreign policy until the spanish-american war and if you read a history of the spanish-american war you will see that many republicans and even democrats who went looked back at John Quincy Adams in Washington and said, "Look, we 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 should have gone to war with Spain. We shouldn't be involved in the. We actually conquered the Philippines and Cuba, right? And we kept the Philippines mm -hmm. as a territory of the United States until, you know, uh, through World War II when the Japanese were fighting us. We got in World War II because we owned the Philippines. We wouldn't have been in World War II. There would have been no reason for the Japanese to attack Pearl Harbor if there hadn't been a Spanish-American right. War." And that we didn't know that because the Philippines sat astride the Japanese sea lane to the Indonesian oil and to the resources of French Indochina. So, <clears throat> so this is how we got into our, and, and back in the day, uh, you know, Henry Adams, the, 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 the grandson of John Quincy Adams, the great grandson of John Adams, 
was a very famous, he was a, uh, a Harvard professor, uh, history professor. He wrote a history of the United States. He at the time was saying, you know, this is a terrible thing to break with Washington, to break with our tradition of staying to our own hemisphere, mm. right? And so that that's why we had the attitude in World War One was actually a bitter experience because why did we fight it? And many Americans were disillusioned by the Versailles Treaty because although there was a lot of hatred of the Germans and Germans were persecuted during the war to some extent here domestically, there was some bad things. There were a lot of people who thought the Germans were treated unfairly that the League of Nations was a pipe dream, that we would be dragged into further conflicts. And Americans didn't want it. They thought that the war was mm. wrong, that these Americans had suffered and died in World War I needlessly. Yeah. And even to, even by even by Hitler's, Adolf Hitler's own calculations, um, the, the total endgame battle uh, would have happened in the 1980s. So this was uh, from... This was from Hitler's second book that he ultimately didn't want published uh, because he sort of gave gave away his overall overall strategy. The um, this the idea when to attack this country and then that country. So in short, Hitler wanted this alliance with the British, and he wanted to make Britain really Germanic, so to speak, and put a certain person on the throne in Britain. And so by by having this this empire uh they wanted to take out of course france they wanted to take out uh the soviet union and ultimately in the uh, in the 1980s meaning 50 years into the future that was the time when hitler expected this great end battle where this german mega empire would then ultimately um attack the united states and of course in in the 1910s in the 1920s um i don't think many people in america Uh, even politicians, I don't think many people understood the rapid progression in technology uh, where you could estimate that as, at a certain point in the distant future, maybe a, an invasion of the United States was, was actually doable. Um, I think people un underestimated uh, that, just like people underestimated now. I mean, who expects today? Who expects an invasion of the United States? People think America is uh, perfectly safe, but... um. As we mentioned before, well, back in the late, as we, yeah, uh, back in as the we late mentioned 19th. before in a show, just, yeah. just to finish this point because I think it's important. Really, um, we, we talked about this in a previous show when, uh, t when today uh, or in the near future, when Russia, when Russia actually takes over Western Europe, um, that would boost Russia's power and make make them uh, powerful enough to actually attack the United States. And I, I don't think Americans in the 1910s 1920s really understood that that progression of technology yeah the the a lot of people don't understand that the ss um under heinrich himmler saw themselves so had this idea of a united europe of actually creating a system uh that they would take you know that every country in europe would have aryans you know people who were of the certain stock, right? Because the Germans had overrun the end of the Roman Empire. They'd gone into Italy. The northern Italians would be counted as Aryans. Some of the people in Spain, a lot of the people in France, um, and of course the British and the Scandinavians. And and of course they might have then, you know, I mean, you even had uh, the, the, what was it? The Viking SS division had Ukrainians in it, I think. Um, so you had people who were considered Aryans in all these countries. And the SS, people forget that the SS was the first pan-European army, maybe since the Roman legions, when the Roman legions were made up of not just Romans, but people from all over Europe. Um, and so it, it, it was, um, they were really uh, going to try to integrate then Europe economically. And of course, Europe has more people than the United States. And if it had access to resources, the resources of Eurasia, like the conquered Soviet Union, the Baku oil fields, in addition to the Romanian oil fields and the minerals of, of the former Soviet Union, uh, this would make a powerful combination. Um, uh, but of course, you have to actually conquer it, which is a problem. And of course, uh, Hitler, in the Hitler's second book that you mentioned, He's got this rather Darwinian 
nations or peoples, they, they kill or be killed, they exterminate, they survive. And he saw countries like the Soviet Union and the United States, because of their size, being the countries of the future or in the British Empire. And he liked, he liked the idea of the British Empire because it's white people ruling over people who aren't white. But he thought that Germany needed the same thing. Germany needed to have yeah. not just Lebensraum, but the territory that was defensible and that contained all the raw materials to make an autarky, right? Because Hitler's economic thinking was, and what our aut autarky means is economically self-sufficient in itself so that it could go to war and not be blockaded, not be strangled and, and build itself up. Now, what would you say is, what do you think people should be aware of in terms of um, America, America being penetrated by Soviet intelligence before World War II? Because many people, they, they know about the Cold War era and we, they know about the moles that were exposed in the Cold War. Um, but what about before World War II? I mean... Um, What was the situation before the war in terms of communist uh, Soviet agents in America? Well, we have a number of good books about this. One is Stalin's Secret Agents, which more covers World War II than the 30s, but it also gives you the idea. Uh, there is also uh, Diana West book, uh, which is uh, American Betrayal, um, which uh, gives a good overview. And in this book, you will find that... Um, You know, the testimony of William Wirt, who was an educator in America, who these communists kind of spoke freely to him at a party about how Roosevelt wasn't one of them, but he was going to help them and they were going to use him to take power in the U.S. And that the New Deal here, uh, when the Depression hit, Roosevelt beats Hoover in the 1932 election. And you already have phenomena like the Bonus Army which was this group of World War I veterans that were camping near Washington and they were gathering and they, you know, uh, Smedley Butler was one of the leaders, yeah, yeah. Um, if I remember correctly. And, and of course, it, it, we, did, we didn't really find out what uh, Herbert Hoover knew when his, his memoirs, his, his, his sort of his magnum opus was published I think it was 10 years ago. It wasn't that long ago. You know, he, his papers were, were really kept in secret. They published them and I read them and he said, look, um, the FBI knew back then that uh, it was very dangerous that the bonus army was the communists were behind it. And he, he writes this in his, in his thing saying, and he warned FDR that these communists were dangerous. They would try to use anything to take over and to not have diplomatic relations with Russia because once you have an embassy and once you have consulates on American soil, they became, become centers mm -hmm. of plotting espionage and organizing you know, communist groups here on American soil. And it was, you know, people don't realize the communists were extremely active at, at the, after World War I. That we had um, communist snipers shooting at doughboys on parades coming home from World War I in California. There's such an incident that they were plot. They thought there was going to be a revolution in America, the Red Scare. Communists threw a bomb through Attorney General Palmer's living room window, blew out the front of his house. You know, so it was, it was a serious thing that we took seriously. In 1923, here in northern Michigan, there was a group of choirs meeting There were hundreds of people meeting and they, they depicted themselves as choirs. It was a com giant communist meeting where they had this camp up, summer camp up here, where they were educating themselves. They were doing classes on how to take over your, your town council, your board of supervisors, your, your, you know, your county government, your church, local civic organizations, how to infiltrate everywhere. And people locally up here got suspicious. It wasn't really that far from where I am right now. And the, uh, I, I believe it was the Michigan National Guard. There's a book called Reds in America, uh, written by a guy named Whitney about this. They came up and they raided the camp after most of these people had left. And they found, I think it was 60 barrels filled with documents hmm. on how to take over the country, all from the grassroots on up. 
And it was, people were shocked. It's like, they're really serious. And of course, taking over education. And this was what, um, but Roosevelt, despite Hoover's warnings to him, don't engage with the Soviet Union. He recognized the Soviet Union mm -hmm. in October 1933, set up an embassy, was very friendly with them, had, you know, very naive about it. And so he, uh, and, and of course, from that point on, you had a guy in the White House whose wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, was, was I mean, almost a communist. I mean, she was so sympathetic yeah, didn't, with communism. Uh, didn't didn't a, uh, one of one of the one of the uh, the Roosevelts? This was, I think, in the eighteen. I don't exactly remember what this was in the eighteen thirties, eighteen forties, maybe. I think his name was Clinton Roosevelt, and he published a book on socialism before Karl Marx actually had uh, published his uh, his Capital. And uh, if people if people can find this text nowadays on the web, um, if if people read Clinton Roosevelt's uh, concept of socialism, it's basically the same as Marx, even though it's written in a clear and simple language. It's not it's not this outrageous uh, gibberish that that Karl Marx had put forward. So. Yeah, I think that uh, that goes back uh, even further, possibly in, in the in the Roosevelt family. Well, yeah, one thing I can comment in in America in terms of subversion of um, because America was a frontier society, there were always people who had communist ideas or socialist ideas, and there were many experiments here in America right. where people set up communities. I think Mark Twain even joked about it in some of his writings that they would set up these communities where everybody was going to share everything. Yeah, and of course these these experiments always failed and ended disastrously, and it it sort of became a there are books about it um, a running joke where you if you want to read the but it's always the same dismal story that the experiment in trying to live you know and share everything in common never really works out, um, and I think in America more than any other country we we experimented with this um, by people doing it freely on their own. Um, uh, so yeah, and then what happened was that the FBI uh, was very vigilant in those days under J. Edgar Hoover, not President Hoover, the head of the FBI. Uh, they said that there were, they estimated, and I'm not sure, this was a report that came out, I think it was in 1936 or 37, that there were 5,000 communist or communist sympathizers in the federal government working at different levels as employees, secretaries, whatever, and that they needed to, something had to be done about it. And FDR made fun of this. And he said, you know, some of my best friends are communists, something like that. You know, it's, and, and then you had um, this Texas congressman who actually started the House Un-American Activities Committee and his name escapes me right now, uh, but he was, he was a Democrat. He wasn't a Republican. He was investigating Nazis and communists. And he got called into the White House more than once saying, it's great that you go after the Nazis, but we don't want you going after the communists. Right. And he, you can read about, you know, his experiences. He wrote about this. And um, I, I've read excerpts from from his writings. He was the guy that when uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy got interested in communism, he went and had dinner with him. And he actually told McCarthy, he goes, this is really dangerous. If you go into this, you're going to have a lot of Americans against you because yeah. this thing is stronger than you realize. And also, so yeah, America yeah. was was penetrated. Yes. And, and also, uh, people need to remember that the Soviet, um, the Soviet war production uh, to a large degree was based on American technology. Now, some people may be familiar with the literature uh, done later by um, uh, Anthony Sutton. I think he was uh, at the Hoover Inst Inst Institution at Stanford uh, for a while. And uh, now, Anthony Sutton, he collected a lot of data uh, concerning technology sales to the Soviet Union. Um, and it's an and, interesting and to collection. Germany, by the way. And, yeah, and, and to it, Germany. And to yeah. Germany, and it's it's an interesting it's an interesting collection of data. I just strongly disagree with his interpretation of the data because he co he came up with this idea that America wanted America wanted to uh, build up these enemies and to then destroy these enemies and somehow profiting and and benefiting from that. Uh, 
a yeah. whole lot. No, that, and, and this that, sort of there was nobody yeah, in, this, in a position of yeah, authority this, that thought that way. And this and this interpretation even got worse when uh, Sutton became interested in. Uh, communist China. He wanted to extend this interpretation to communist China as if anybody would be dumb enough to build up two large enemies, Soviet Russia and communist China. You know, America building up two great enemies that soon became, you know, atomic powers, uh, building them up to defeat them. That this is not, you know, to yeah, have this, this is big why war. Anthony Sutton is a Anthony Sutton's a poor social scientist who didn't really understand political sociology at all. What he didn't understand is that capitalists, yeah, capitalists make deals with people to make money. That's what they do. They don't really, uh, c capitalists are such monomaniacs. They're focused on their business. They're focused on the making of money. And the fact that they are a byproduct of this is that enemies are built up. They're, they're not really aware of it like we are. And, and so then to turn that stupidity that capitalist stupidity into a conspiracy is a misreading of history, yeah. um, which which I think is 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 important to say. I mean, look, a lot of people in America, and you know, the the Bush family is an example. They were involved in it. a lot of Wall Street people were investing in the Third Reich, right? And and there were people that were investing in the so there were American engineers and uh, uh, that went over to the Soviet Union and helped them build things. I mean. Much of what was built in the Soviet Union and Germany uh, came from America. Yeah, and also um, there was um, a lot of covering up uh, in these um, in these left wing in these left wing American newspapers. A lot of covering up for what was going on in the Soviet Union, especially the Gulag system, which even became a thing in 1920 around roundabout. And and yeah, there was the Ukraine this movie. Family. Yeah, there was this movie. Yeah. There was this movie made on. Uh, this was pretty. This was a pretty good one. I think this was even a Ukrainian production a couple of years ago. People can find that on Amazon Prime and these other streaming platforms. I don't remember the exact title, but I watched it with my wife. It's about. Um, it's about this this uh, this guy who is almost a bit bit of a spy, and he goes to Soviet Union. At first, he's in the. I think in the capital, uh, in Russia there, and he sees all these star journalists from the New York Times and all these other publications. And these so-called journalists, they're not really doing any investigating. They're not really covering they're what's going on. They're having orgies. They're having and using drugs. They're having orgies. There's gay gay journalists. In, in and they're having fun in yeah. Moscow and they're having fun. And they are writing these puff pieces. They send them home and they get published in America. So Americans didn't really know what was going on in Soviet Russia. And this one guy, he actually uh, has uh, I think Ukrainian relatives or his ukrainian mother or something and he sneaks his way into soviet ukraine and he stumbles upon the holodomor the um engineered famine you know this this uh complete and utter um ethnic cleansing genocide that the russians were conducting in ukraine so he has his little camera and he sh starts shooting photos and he sees all these dead people and he finds the hometown of I don't I don't know if it was his mother or anything and he gets caught he sort of gets out of Russia and uh, the papers do not want to run his stories at first and this uh, mm -hmm. actually took a while until the truth actually was yeah was both the British because you see what had happened in the 1920s is that all these countries developed uh, who were would have never recognized the Soviet Union except that the the Soviets did this Operation Trust, and they had the Lenin had the NEP, the New Economic Policy, where they retreated into capitalism. And people thought, oh, the Soviet Union is becoming a normal country because communism doesn't work, and so they opened trade. The British opened trade. The Germans, the French, the Scandinavians. This was a mistake because NEP was a dis, just it wasn't. It, they were just doing it temporarily to build up strength, that there was no real monarchist alliance of central Russia that was going to turn Russia into a monarchy again. And so uh, they were all fooled. And once they got into trading with Russia, they were making money, they didn't want to stop. And so then you, so you had powerful, and then you had the politicians that would be embarrassed by their mistake. Hmm. They didn't want to admit it. Um, and of course, the big American journalist who won I think he won a Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, he did. Walter Durante, 
yeah. was a New York Times correspondent in Moscow, and he's depicted in this film. This film, by the way, that you're talking about uh, is a true story, and this British journalist that went and discovered the Hall of Demore, he stuck to his guns, but he he did his career came to an end, mm -hmm. basically, as a journalist, because he wanted to talk about this. And of course, the terror famine, we've got Robert Conquest's book here, The Harvest of Sorrow, uh, about how 7 to 11 million Ukrainians were systematically murdered in a terror famine to force the, the, the agriculture, to collectivize the agriculture, to put agriculture under a communist system of control. And of course, uh, I, sh I should mention Walter De Durante, the journalist who told all these lies about how good the Soviet Union was, covered up all their crimes in the 1920s and 30s. He met Aleister Crowley no in Paris, way. I think in 1919. <laughs> Yes, he did. And he participated in magical rituals oh, with Aleister Crowley. I'm not kidding. This is, uh, so I just thought because we'd covered this. So there's yeah. always these cross currents, yeah. right? Uh, with these people who are basically agents of yeah. the, the bad world guys. Is a, the world is a small place. Well, well, Crowley, uh, yeah. Aleister Crowley leads us directly to uh, Britain or as, as it was known back then, the British Empire, because Britain... In the 1920s and 1930s, Britain was uh, still a massive empire. I think when the war ended, Britain was officially in control of 700 million people worldwide. Now, of course, this was a weird empire because it was not a continental large uh, territory such as uh, America, but it was these, these tiny little islands, uh, the British islands in, in Europe, and then, of course, you had these colonies that were not as stable as Britain would have liked. So that's a very strange empire. Yeah. And also, um, um, and also, it, there was always the threat of the British islands being overrun. This threat has always been there, especially since the Napoleonic era. And so that that was always a concern to the British. And um, so at the time, Britain uh, Britain knew that. Uh, the Germans were angry at them, and that's why Britain, uh, as well as the Russians, they spread this uh, conspiracy propaganda, s telling people that um, it was the Jews uh, that were responsible for World War One, and not all these other factors and players and and um, dynamics. Right. So this was one of the ideas that the British had, sort of to. Uh, mitigate the risk of German revenge and maybe French revenge, okay? So uh, the nightmare for the British was clearly um, some sort of an alliance or, or a, a, uh, a deal between the French, uh, the, fr uh, the French and the Germans. Because if, if those two got together, they could have overrun the British islands and that would have probably been the end of the British Empire. So that was kind of where the British were at. Um, and also, um, there's there's this uh, factor which the Germans were not really aware of, and and that's the these older these older aristocratic intelligence networks, and they were all over Germany because various German territories uh, used to be the home or the original home of many of these aristocratic um, families that ruled Britain. So you go to Mecklenburg, you go to Schleswig-Holstein, you go to Hessen, you go to Hannover. These places in Germany, um, this is the origin of what later became the British Empire. And so uh, it was so, so, um, exactly those aristocratic families that were um, happy to spread conspiracy propaganda um, about Jews um, in the right-wing in the right-wing circles, the Völkische movement. Okay, so this was mm -hmm. this was in the later 1800s, and this was copied verbatim by the National Socialist uh, Party. They were basing their entire view on history on that conspiracy uh, on conspiracy narrative, and um, and building on that conspiracy narrative, um, the British, or let's say uh, the the aristocratic British, they. Um, created this deception this is what uh, louis kilzer wrote about in his book churchill's deception and also his book about martin bormann hitler's traitor um it was sort of this charade this theater pretending um to like the national socialists so th these were these british circles 
that uh, uh, pretended to be sympathetic to fascism. But they really weren't sympathetic. Is no, that right? no, because uh, I mean, clearly, when when the Nazis um, when the Nazis took power, they uh, they loved their British contacts. They always visited the British, and they had high high ranking British visitors in Germany. And so they would tell these British, "We we we like you, we love you, we think we are one Nordic, uh, one Nordic people, and we need to stick together." Um, and there was also this this uh, concept, but the British they sometimes they even told the Germans, uh, "Look, we don't want Germany uh, to triple in size because that makes us British nervous. You must understand that, dear National Socialists." But they wouldn't want to hear it. So the British kept playing into this Nazi wishful thinking. Uh, and that sort of created an intelligence problem uh, for the British because all that schmoozing with the fascists scared a lot of people in Britain, um, especially well, the, 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 the younger actually, generations. Yeah, the British actually sent an ambassador, uh, Neville Henderson, to Germany, to the Third Reich. And Henderson was really very like the Germans, and he became rather close friends with Hermann Goering. And um, Henderson um, was one of these people that was sent there to manage a German relationship. They needed somebody who was really friendly and like the Nazis. And it's interesting to watch. There's newsreels of Henderson after the war started talking about the nature of Hitler and uh, Goering. Uh, afterwards, which is very interesting. He he wrote a book afterwards, too, which is really interesting. Um, perhaps one of the most um, intriguing characters, diplomatic characters of the war. Um, and maybe we can get back to when the war started. Uh, he actually tried to uh, throw a tantrum in front of Hitler rather than Hitler throwing a tantrum. And that's an interesting story <laughs> in itself. But but And, of course, Hitler did not react. He just sat there very calmly. Mm -hmm. And Henderson was going... I couldn't ruffle the guy, you know, yeah. I couldn't, he was very calm, Yeah, some which these, meant that Hitler was acting when he was doing it too, throwing yeah. tantrums. Um, yeah. some of but, these, it, but it's, um, yeah, but anyway, these, yeah, the British, the British had this. Yeah. Some of these, some of these younger, uh, these younger British, um, they, they came from these old families. They went to Cambridge. They went to these, these elite universities. Um, but um, they were not, in the loop, so to say, they did not know about this deception maneuver that was um, concocted by Winston Churchill, the King, and others. Um, and so these these young people at these elite universities, they became scared of fascism. They they thought that Britain was going into that fascist direction, and that's why uh, Soviet intelligence could could use that fear uh, and recruit young British men from these upper circles and th this is ultimately and there what was became a genuine the... fascist movement in britain under oswald sure. mosley oswald Mo yeah and, people and should course, check even, out yeah yeah what were the sisters uh that hitler was close to these people um one Absolutely, of them i think yeah. committed suicide or tried right after the war started because of the war between the two countries that they loved you know and i think uh, most of these people were interned was it on the isle of wight that they were interned in a, in a camp during the war something like that yeah and it's, it was yeah. it was just it was so it was such a convincing charade and some of these british probably even were not in the loop themselves they were taking part in this and they were probably believing in in it um but um some of these young british they became so worried they started to spy for the soviets and this ultimately became the cambridge five you know the cambridge spy ring that they, they were uh, philby philby burgess Roger McLean, Anthony Blunt, McLean. you know, these people, they were so yeah. afraid of fascism and they didn't understand the Soviet threat because they didn't understand the Soviet Union enough. So that became sort of a, an intelligence problem for the British. But they still had, you know, these aristocratic assets on German territory. And we later found out that um, when, the, when the Second World War was over, um, Lord, Lord Louis Mountbatten uh, had inherited the task of um you know managing these secret communication channels you know between britain and germany you know between these aristocrats and uh so uh lord louis mountbatten he sent anthony blunt to of all people to collect these um secret correspondence papers 
uh, to, to go to Germany and collect all these papers from, from these various castles and bring them home to Britain. But we have to consider the possibility that Anthony Blunt gave copies of everything to the Soviets. And, uh, of course, that became sort of... Um, this great suspicion against Lord Louis Mountbatten, who was so high up the chain and he became so so involved in NATO. Um, he had communist contacts and um, he was considered compromised by British intelligence professionals, French um, intelligence professionals, and even the FBI. The FBI opened a file um, on, on Lord Louis Mountbatten. And, and this man... Through his relatives on the throne, he had access to all British intelligence and some American intelligence because of these shared yeah. projects. So, so yeah. Britain was penetrated, America yeah. was penetrated, um, and of course, you had Harry Hopkins, who actually lived in the White House, who people called him a co-president, who was, uh, many people believe he was Agent 19. Um, there was a study done showing that he had to be the agent, uh, the, the top agent feeding information. You had Alger Hiss in the State Department. You had uh, Harry Dexter White in the Treasury Department, who um, was thought to be uh, responsible for helping to bring about a war between Japan and the United States by provoking Pearl Harbor by a communique that he wrote um, when we imposed sanctions on Japan in 1941. So, um, it, it's yeah both countries are and germany's penetrated oh boy uh by the right and maybe you can speak to that about people like martin Bormann and and heinrich Mueller, yeah. the head of the gestapo well the, the 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 situation was so dire after world war one I. I mean people have to imagine uh not just the war was lost um germany had uh, very soon become demilitarized i mean there was there was no military to speak of, and uh, they were allowed to keep, I think, a hundred thousand troops. I think something, they were yeah, to some, keep. something like that. And it was there was nothing after having millions under arms. Yeah, then uh, the the Treaty of Versailles, all these payments that had to be made, and all these restrictions put on the German military. So there was a whole laundry list of what the Germans couldn't have and couldn't build, and this and that. So this was not just the only problem. Um, the uh, you saw a breakdown of counterintelligence, uh, and you also saw a breakdown of the economy. You had communists, you had communist circles spreading everywhere in Germany. Um, this even happened at the end of World War One. When uh, uh, these these um, military officers started to uh, uh, disobey orders, and all these little communist um, uh, little republics kept popping up everywhere, all over all over Germany. So this is in Hamburg. This is in other places. For a time in Munich, all these places where suddenly communists are taking over the buildings of government and they form their own little communist uh mini country so to say it's like uh sometimes it was a city sometimes it was less than a city but this happened everywhere so um that's when you saw these uh, so-called freikorps groups um uh, coming into form these were former soldiers these veterans and some of these new kids you know like martin bormann or one of my ancestors theo benish he was uh he was almost too young to fight in World War I. Um, so they all became involved with this, this new radical movement. But um, the situation was so dire at the time, especially financially, that um, uh, this created an intelligence nightmare because many people could be bought by the Soviets, uh, even you know, either by direct payments or by, um, let's say, help in advancing a career because you didn't know what your life was going to be like if you're uh, 20 years old or you're 25 you're 30 years old you don't know what the future will hold and there's these people that offer you opportunities and they offer you money and they can get you started so we saw a complete almost complete breakdown of um of counterintelligence now a lot has been written and said about these these right-wing or ultra right-wing freikorps groups um, and if you were involved in those, like Martin Bormann uh, was very young, if you were involved in those early, you had a, a, a great shot at a huge career in the National Socialist Party. The earlier you joined and the more loyalty you showed, the more uh, prospect, prospects you had for a career. But if, this, if, Soviet, intelligence, um, if Soviet intelligence had, um, had uh, you know, 
recruited these young Germans, Soviet intelligence could could um, you know get these young people to rise up higher and higher and higher, especially in the National Socialist Party, and that to this very day that has never been properly reconstructed. There's almost nobody who would ever ever touch this topic this uh, insane infiltration of Germany before the war because apparently you know the the second world war is such a touchy subject um, in connection with the Holocaust so nobody really wants to mess with the Russians when it comes to this because if somebody yeah, put and out, they don't, and, if somebody yeah, puts out a ahead. study if somebody put out a study on this and this gained traction and and became uh, a public phenomenon, this would create a massive diplomatic incident. Incident. The Russians would absolutely yeah. not tolerate this. You know, if you told the well, uh, um, history of that, you uh, it, it, it's what people don't understand about uh, Germany in this period was that what we are seeing today in Germany, in the United States, for example, is this far left, far right convergence, where the middle is being torn apart. And the society is being uh, polarized and divided. And this is what happened in Weimar, Germany. And um, uh, it, a lot of people don't realize uh, that uh, the, 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 the German rebellion, the Nazi party uprising in Bavaria in 1923, in November 1923, was originally coordinated with Karl Radek meeting with top Nazi officials um, saying there was going to be a simultaneous uprising in Berlin. Now, they were hoping to make Bavaria like a separate republic, um, but it was, it was uh, it, the communists were actually thinking in terms of a revolution in, our, a sort of ostensibly right-wing revolution in Bavaria that would be aligned with the communists taking over Berlin. At the time, the Nazis yeah. didn't have any position in, um, in Prussia, in the in the in the main part of Germany in the in the north and the east, but they had this in in Bavaria. So this is very interesting. And uh, Viktor Suvorov, in his book *The Chief Culprit*, uh, mentions this this coordination in the two revolutions. He actually mentions, you know, the Bolshevik Revolution. It actually happened on what November seventh, right? And what was the date of the Nazi revolution? And what was the date of the, the Munich Beer Hall push? See, there was these similarities in dates. He actually has this section where he writes about the similarity between the Nazis. And this is where, where convergence comes in. This is rather brilliant. He's, he, he writes as follows. Hitler had a red flag. Stalin had a red flag. Hitler ruled in the name of the workers' class. His party was called the Workers' Party. Stalin also ruled in the name of the workers' class. Hitler hated democracy and struggled against it. Stalin hated democracy and struggled against it. Hitler was building socialism, and Stalin was building socialism. Under the title of socialism, Hitler saw a classless society. So did Stalin. Um, Hitler held his road to socialism as the only correct one. Stalin also held his road to socialism was uniquely correct. Hitler mercilessly destroyed all his party comrades, such as Rem and his followers, when they strayed from the correct path. Stalin also mercilessly destroyed all who strayed from the correct path. Hitler had a four-year plan. Stalin had a five-year plan. In Hitler's Germany, one party was in power, the others in jail. And in Stalin's Soviet Union, one party was in power, the others in jail, and so on. I mean, this he goes on, and he can go on for a page and a half. Yeah. like this. The similarities are amazing. And Hitler himself actually bragged that some of the best national socialists had been recruited from the ranks of the communists. Yeah. And also people, um, people, uh, you know, the, 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 a lot has been written about um, how the Nazis um, were collecting dirt against each other. So this became almost like a uh, like a sport, you know, with the with the NSDAP. So everybody was collecting incriminating evidence against everybody and was stashing it somewhere, sometimes even in, in foreign countries where the information was safe. You know, you had all these dead man switches. You know, if something happens to me, this information gets you know released and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, and so um, when you mix the, you know, when you have all these communist uh, Soviet spies inside of Germany that, of course, um, 
uh, makes it likely that most of this information found its way to Moscow, and they could also use it in on German soil to advance somebody's career and to stop somebody else's career. And we we mentioned this in one of the the la- last shows about um about Adolf Hitler himself. You know, Adolf Hitler possibly uh, poisoned his own father because he hated him and uh, his father didn't want him to become uh, an, an artist and um so hitler hitler may have poisoned his own father and uh, the 2008 study by lothar machtan was very convincing it was about hitler's sexuality and the espionage aspects of it uh, and so we know that Röhm. i mean everybody knows Röhm was gay and he wasn't the only gay uh, official of a high standing in, in, in the Nazi the, party. The SA, which was the yeah. uh, stormtroopers, the Nazi stormtroopers, were um, there were many homosexuals in the SA. Yeah, I mean the the gay ca- I mean the the gay centers were Munich and Berlin. So this this had especially in the nineteen in the nineteen twenties um, there was a a, uh, a a large gay scene in Berlin and Munich and also in Vienna. And so these people knew each other. And when it comes to Adolf Hitler, he did have some some limited attraction to women in a weird fashion. That's what the American uh, Americans figured out in their uh, assessments of Hitler's personality. He had some sort of weird fetishes about women. Um, but uh, when you look at the study by Lothar Machtan, it's, it's very convincing. Um, for the most part, Adolf Hitler was was gay and uh he always was around well there's and- also i should mention um uh ernst hamstangel's uh book oh uh, he Hamst- collected Hamst- stuff Hamstangel, yeah. yeah he was an american german uh i believe his mo- her, his mother's side of the family was american they had a uh business that was in new york in bavaria um and he was a very educated he played the piano beautifully and and uh hitler really loved his piano playing soothed Hitler. He became friends with Hitler early and he was trying to get Hitler away from the anti-Semitism part of it. In fact, he even tried to introduce Hitler to Churchill uh, in the in the early days of the Nazi movement. But Hamstangel um, uh, describes Hitler's sexuality. And Hamstangel's Hitler would pretend to be in love with Hamstangel's wife. And the, he often went to their house for dinner and so on. And his Hamstangel's wife's reaction to Hitler's pretending yeah. to love her beauty and whatever was, he's a neuter. Hitler's a neuter, she called him. That is, he's a he's an he's sexually he's a nothing. Very peculiar thing that his wife said about him. And he also spoke often about there was something wrong with Hitler sexually. Yeah. And this and, is scattered yeah, throughout Hamstangel's memoirs. And and there were police files various types of police files um about hitler from his early days when he was not a politician um you know police files in vienna police files in munich and and we know that from among others uh, lothar machtan's study uh some uh, there was this one military officer in germany he had copies of um of police files on hitler including photos and and, and all of that and so this was used as protection um, but there was also this one scientist, he was sort of a left-wing scientist, and he was an expert on sexual uh, research, and he collected police files um, and uh, put put everything into a package and, and, and had it sent to Moscow, essentially. So we have to assume that the Russians um, had this material as well. And... Um, and so there were all these, all these. There was all this incriminating material that was uh, going around. And when Hitler took power, he immediately tried to uh, find as much of this material as possible. So there's, um, especially after the Röhm Putsch, the uh, you know these 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 soldiers they were breaking into all kinds of uh, uh, houses and and. Uh, opening all these uh, safes and to find incriminating material and and just to uh, remove it and and, tra- and destroy it, so that was kind of the this insane this insane uh, counterintelligence fiasco that was happening in Germany, and some people might say, well, but you know, wasn't there an economic rebound? Why, why you know, wasn't wasn't money uh, you know wasn't the money good at some point? The economy was good. 
you know, this this would have made it harder for the Soviets to uh, buy people, you know, just to um, recruit people with money. Well, um, there was an economic rebound, of course, in the 1930s. Um, this was the, the so-called Reinhardt program. This was based on the British uh, Baron John Maynard Keynes, you know, Keynesian economics and all that. So with that program, um, Germany was out of crisis mode by 1936. So uh, that's a couple of years before the war. Um, but there were still many, many problems. Um, it was still and many, they were many, back in crisis in 1938. Yeah, there was still many, many problems. And there was also a large issue with debt. So they had um, the, uh, you know, the, this, this official Hjalmar Schacht. And in 1933, um, he created this, this sort of, um, you know, you could maybe you could call it a credit default swap. It's sort of this, you know, way of creating debt and not call it debt. So this was a handy dandy tool. It, it almost created a parallel currency besides the Reichsmark. And this is how they financed the, um, this is how they financed the army and, and all the, uh, the military goods. Um, but um, this, of course, created all kinds of problems. And many people warned Hitler about this debt. And they uh, suggested to Hitler that certain um, goods should not be produced anymore luxurious goods the prices had to be adjusted to reality but hitler was strongly against it because he figured that the people will love him as long as these prices are good and the market seems fine and everybody can buy all these different goods uh so this was uh, this was sort of uh, hitler's opinion on that but um overall germany was falling behind uh germany was especially falling behind the united states because uh um in, in America, by that time, uh, the Americans, they could mass produce quality vehicles, quality cars and make a profit on it. Now, it seems like a no brainer, you know, these days, of course, the, you know, car companies make profits, but this was not a given, especially at the time, especially in Germany. So um, the Germans, the Nazis, they were not uh, able to actually mass produce cars and make a profit. They, they had... Uh, this idea of making what later became the Volkswagen Beetle. Now, if people remember the old Beetle car, it was this round little funny looking car, um, had a pretty weak engine, I think it was air cooled. And, um, and so the earlier iteration of that car was called the KDF car. You know, was, this, this was, um, uh, this, this stood for uh, Kraft durch Freude. This, this means power through joy, right? This was the idiotic name they were giving this car, and they wanted to mass produce it for the, the population, but according to their own calculations, they would make a significant loss on each car they produce and sell. Uh, same problem in the housing market. There were just not enough apartments for people. I mean, Hitler wanted, to, to, wanted the Germans to make babies and, and create all these new warriors. Uh, and workers, but um, there was just no space for these people. There were no apartments for them. And so they figured um, they figured they could build new apartments, but they would be very small. No, no kitchen, uh, no bathroom, no central heating, no hot wa running hot water. Compared this to America, the United States, where even the lowest paid guy at a Ford or GM uh, automotive plant, even the lowest paid guy in America could have like four room apartment and running water and, uh, and his own kitchen and, you know, real toilet, his own toilet. So this was sort of the, the underlying problem that people didn't really see. And many Germans uh, didn't even own a radio. You know, this is uh, something that became more widespread when the Germans actually made a cheaper radio, the so-called Volksempfänger, the, the people's radio. Um, but um, it was just not many people had a radio for a very long time. And, and the Americans by that time, they had radios. Americans had telephones. This was becoming very common. Uh, you could have a Sears catalog in America and just mail order all these cool items, all these cool things. You didn't have that in Germany. And so um, th there was just no competitive products uh, coming out of Germany uh, for the world market. So by doing these calculations... 
Germany kept falling behind, and there was another big problem, which was the uh, the farming sector, because roughly a third of the German economy was still farming. And for farming, you need space. You need more space to to uh, to produce more more grain or potatoes or whatever. But Germany just did not have the space. Now, um, when Hitler was talking about Lebensraum in his uh, book Mein Kampf, you know, the living space in the East, this was not just his grandiose idea of having a large population. This was not just ideology. It was just straight up economics. And people can... I would suggest people read this book called Wages of Destruction by Adam Tooze. Now, he specialized in these topics and he just dissected the whole economic reality of of Nazi Germany. And uh, he estimates that Germany at the time, uh, Germany was behind the United States um, by about 25 to 30 years. 25 to 30 years behind and things were not looking good they were not catching up they were even falling further behind so this was also one of the reasons ultimately um, for this decision to uh, invade Poland and to go to go east this was also the economics Um, well let me let me suggest another cause of this because I was interested. I did a sort of a private study where I tried to figure out what were Hitler's motives when. And so Hitler would make these casual comments to Goebbels or other Nazis about his intentions. And he would say, for example, well, uh, when we go to war with the Soviet Union, Poland and Italy are going to be my allies. This was kind of what he wanted to do. And he, he, he asked France for a non-aggression pact. He wanted to demilitarize the French-German border. And and, uh, but, of course, the French turned him down and, and, and decided to make some agreements with the Soviet Union. Uh, and Hitler, of course, pretended to be a man of peace. But behind the scenes, the way they were building up their military, it looked like they were looking at 19, to start the war in the 41, 42. They would have the weapons they wanted. But in 1937, there was a guy named uh, Felix Kirsten, who was a German who acquired Finnish nationality, fought in the Finnish Civil War, where the Reds, the one civil war in the former Russian Empire, where where the Reds lost. And so he, but he learned from, he learned the Chinese medicine and massage from a Chinese doctor in Germany, and he became very skilled at it. He he had very lucrative clients, uh, I think the royal family in Holland, uh, he had um, Mussolini's um, uh, son-in-law, uh, Count Ciano, was one of his clients. And ultimately, Himmler, the head of the SS, became one of Felix Kirsten's clients. He didn't want him. But when you get uh, invited to, what was it, um, Prince Al- Albrechtstrasse, where the headquarters of the SS was, if I'm remembering the street they were located on correctly, um, that you don't, you can't turn it down. It's not safe, and of course he ended up becoming then an intimate because he was the only person who could cure. Uh, Himmler had a bad conscience, as you might imagine a mass murderer would, and he, when he would do evil things, he would get massive cramping of his of his stomach and his intestines, and the only way this stress would be relieved would be Felix Kirsten to administer to him. So there's a book, I think The Man with the Magical Hands, I think is the title of the book, but it's Felix Kirsten's story. And he was shown at one point, Himmler had behind his desk, he had a wall safe. And one day he opened it up and he, he was, Himmler was very upset. And it was during the war. And he said, I need you to see this. This document was made in 1937. And it was, I think it was two doctors did this. They they had a physical examination of Hitler, and it was their opinion that Hitler had just entered into early stages of syphilis, yeah. and that he was headed for syphilitic psychosis or sorry syphilitic paralysis because it, it, it heads towards this, and that um, and and of course what's interesting in November of 1937 is when Hitler sort of had this first meeting of his generals and admirals and saying. 
we got to get ready for war. We're going to be more aggressive. We're going to do different things. We're going to have enemies. Um, and of course, you know, I think there's a relationship. And it, and by the way, um, Walter Schellenberg also was shown the same 28, 29 page medical report on Hitler. So Schellenberg was shown this by Hitler too. Schellenberg was quite close to Hitler. Um, and that it, it, it greatly upset Heinrich Himmler because he knew that Hitler, and then we've got Hitler's regular doctor, um, Dr. Morell. And Dr. Morell was a specialist at treating syphilis. And I think Dr. Morell started going to work with him in 37 or 38. You could correct me if I'm wrong on that. And of course, what was his treatment of Hitler? He gave these little pills to Hitler and they were, I think it was strychnine, which was a, 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 a small dose of it, not lethal, but it was sort of like chemo for syphilis. And it would retard the advance of the disease, but also it had, it had some harmful effects on the patient. And so it would keep the disease at bay. And then, of course, people later were saying, well, Hitler had, um, uh, di didn't, didn't have syphilis. He had um, Parkinson's or something. Yeah. Parkinson's, right, when they show his handshaking. Well, the thing is, is they can mimic each other because it's it's a neurological yeah. disease. Degenerative. And, and when you go to, there is a ego inflation and a mania that goes with syphilis. And, of course, this was the thing that Schellenberg felt. Schellenberg was urging Himmler behind Hitler's back to overthrow Hitler, to make him retire for reasons of health. This is towards the end of the war. People were trying to bring this war to an end early. But I think that perhaps the fact that Hitler got aggressive and seems to have, he really, people said, some biographers say that Hitler was really disappointed by Munich in 1938 because he wanted hmm. the war to begin that. Yeah, right? he was have you heard this? Well, he was, I mean, I, I, um, I'm also convinced that he felt he was running out of time. There were quite a few, uh, quite a few people that um, that um, were told that were told directly by Hitler that he wasn't going to be around for much longer. That, that his uh, his successors would continue his work, and he always wanted to uh, he wanted to make these territorial gains, build these gigantic structures. You know, have a new city, a new capital uh, built. And these outrageous buildings uh, created so that everybody would remember him after his death. So he wouldn't be forgotten and his successor wouldn't outshine him in any way. Um, and uh, yeah, so this was, I mean, the clock was definitely ticking for, uh, the clock was definitely ticking for him. And so there was there was his, his health. Uh, there was um, sort of this idea of a window of opportunity and of course i, I just mentioned the economic factors so the talk was uh, the clock was definitely uh, ticking not just for hitler but also for germany as an empire germany hadn't been a real empire uh for the longest time it was just these mini kingdoms and and you know you had a count here and a prince there and they were all sort of different and um in 1871 that was the first time you actually had some sort of a some sort of a unified empire, which was not that unified because all these different aristocratic lines, uh, they they had sort of their own ideas. So it was either expand the empire and have the space and, and you know, get what the empire needed, which was oil and steel and, and you know, uh, a place and to grain. grow. A place to grow grain, get what you need. And this was, and the aggressiveness uh, that was required, this was sort of the only way you could have a f uh, an empire in the future. So the choice was just move along and, and not be aggressive and have zero chance of a successful empire or take your chances, have a war and hope for the best. And this was considered to be the only shot um, at, at an empire, to have an empire in the future. Mm -hmm. And in 2000, in 2015, an interesting book came out. I don't know if there's an English version of it. It was uh, it was done by Karina Urbach, and it's called Hitler's Heimliche Helfer, Hitler's Secret Helpers. And this was almost the first one of the first real studies uh, done on the role of the aristocracy in the Nazi Party, because all these aristocrats they happily joined the Nazi Party, and that was a huge factor 
in not just the success of the Nazi party, but also the war. Because um, having these aristocrats on board gave Hitler or gave the impression of legitimacy to Hitler, not just in the broad population, but also within the party and among the generals, because the generals, they were almost all of them were aristocrats too from these uh, very high, high ranking old families. And also um, these aristocratic families, especially like um, you had uh, Prince Philip von Hessen, you know, he was managing Nazi relations to Italy, Mussolini and the King of Italy. And uh, and also um, there was Karl Eduard Herzog von Sachsen, Coburg und Gotha. He was related to Queen Victoria and uh, he joined the Nazi party very early uh, in the game. And uh, he managed relations between Hitler and the English kings, Edward VIII and George the sixth. So uh, with his diplomacy behind the scenes, he created the impression that Britain could actually join uh, Germany, especially when it came to the war against Poland, the, the Blitzkrieg invasion of Poland. This created the impression that the British were, would not really intervene. So this was the, the uh, you know, the wishful thinking that you could take Poland and not really get into much trouble with the British. And if the British don't really get active, the French will not really get active. And that also played a, yeah, an that's, important part. That's true. We should mention appeasement policy and Neville Chamberlain um, briefly here. Um, Neville Chamberlain and the British may be part of this deception, but they thought they thought if Hitler it's it's fine with us basically this is neville chamberlain if hitler wants to go and attack the soviet union they're they're not a country we like either if that's what he wants to do fine let's make sure he feels comfortable with us that we satisfy him and of course uh you had in uh what march 1938 you had the anschluss where they just sort of bum rushed austria and and took it over and there was no real resistance in Austria. Austria had been a sort of conservative, conservative dictatorship um, uh, before then. And of course, that was successful. And then on the heels of this, Hitler immediately starts plotting to on Sudetenland and talking about invading uh, Czechoslovakia. And uh, this leads to the Czech crisis where Neville Chamberlain flies to Munich and they have this big, you know, they're very close to war. They're thinking there's going to be this war because Hitler is, you know, basically just practically, you know, falling on the ground, foaming at the mouth, chewing the carpet. This is the joke about Hitler that people say in the West. But um, Neville Chamberlain gets this agreement that Germany gets the parts of Czechoslovakia, the Sudetenland, that are um, those parts that are German. And then then he promises he's not going to go after anything more. Hitler sort of promised the British and said, you know, my demands are done. This is it. This is all I want. And of course, they, they go through this, but the Allies, uh, I, I, they knew, the British and the French knew that um, they couldn't really trust him. And what, it ha what happened in November of 1938, after this agreement was signed, was the Kristallnacht where the you had this long knives. yeah well the the, the yeah the the crystal knock in 1938 oh, in which the jewish oh, the shops were attacked yeah. and jews were and and this was shocking to people in the west and in january of 1939 mm -hmm. i think it was january uh uh halifax who was the the british foreign minister and chamberlain went to see mussolini in rome and uh, obviously Hitler was going to find this out. And Hitler had been, on May 5th, 1938, Hitler had a trip to Rome where he tried to make this agreement. And Mussolini was kind of sort of, yeah, okay, kind of, sort of. It wasn't really firm. And so there was this fighting over what, you know, because Italy was with the Allies in World War One, And so it wasn't really clear. And, and of course, Hitler was grateful to Mussolini for not intervening in the Anschluss because, remember, Mussolini had forbidden the Nazis, forbidden Hitler from taking Austria up into a certain point. And then he allowed this. And Hitler said publicly he felt all this gratitude to Mussolini. This is sort of how this 
this relationship started to develop. So you had this, this tussle over what side Italy is going to be on if there's a war. So the British weren't completely naive. But then when, when appeasement policy ended was, ni was March of 1939, what does Hitler do? You have the Czechoslovakia split. The Slovaks didn't want anything to do with the Czechs. The Czechs had been rather dominant within the Czechoslovakian political system, and a lot of the ethnic minorities within the Czechoslovak state felt that the Czechs unfairly dominated within this polity. Um, and so the, so the Slovaks made an alliance with Hitler. They, they came on board with Hitler. And then you had the Czech rump state. It's just Czechia, very small, Bohemia, Moravia. And you have Hungary wants a chunk of that, right? Um, Poland wanted a chunk of that. Um, and so Germany's thinking, these other countries are going to, this is a, and by the way, it's a valuable, the Czechs are hardworking Slavs who had this industrial region in their territory that, as a matter of fact, the Czech Panzer 38 is a great tank. It's probably better than all the German tanks. Yeah, the Skoda the factories, uh, the Skoda factories yeah. and other. Uh, Skoda works. Yeah. 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 I mean, and so this was a prize. And so Hitler in March of 1938, he just, he actually he got the uh, the leading politician in Czechia to come to Berlin, and he really intimidated the guy and he browbeat the guy into surrendering his country as a Reich protectorate of Moravia and Bohemia. I think is what they called it. Isn't that right? I think so. I am. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. I... And so then he just invaded it, and the British public regarded it as a betrayal. And when Chamberlain went to say, well, we need to continue appeasement policy because we want Hitler's aggression focused east, hmm. not on the west, the British public said, no, we are done trusting Hitler. And then the pressure was on. Churchill's stock was rising, and it was the, it was, then it was Poland, and the corridor crisis came next. And maybe you could explain what the Polish corridor was and why that was important. Well, the, um, Germany in the past was bigger, um, considerably bigger. There was um, what they call it the corridor. It's um, it's uh, it's a stretch of territory right at the uh, what we call the Ostsee, the um, the the ocean um, in the north and uh, the Baltic Sea. Exactly. So um, you know Kaliningrad. Königsberg, you know, this is some some of the territories now in possession of Russia, by the way, this is a small bit of Russia that sits uh, very close to Germany, if people are not aware of that. Um, so yeah, th there was a, used to be the German city of Königsberg. Right. And so there was, um, there was uh, uh, what they call East, East Prussia, Ostpreußen, this was sort of uh, the back country area of Germany. And um, they had this, um, they had this man in charge, uh, of uh, of East Prussia, I think his name was Erich Koch, and there's a really good book on him uh, that came out a few years ago. And so he was this hyper ambitious man uh, who had these aristocratic friends, and and he he wanted he wanted a command, he wanted to to rule over part of Germany, and and he got to rule this uh, corridor, but part of this this eastern corridor basically of Germany. And uh, when these these further wars happened. He became in charge of um, occupied Poland and later occupied Ukraine. So he became the biggest territorial master within the and Nazi there were some, system. Some of my Ukrainian friends think that he was a Soviet agent, which is interesting. It is, it's very likely. I mean, he sabotaged he sabotaged a lot, uh, especially the uh, the escape. So at the very last moment, uh, people were allowed to escape from the. Um, from the Soviet army that was uh, that was advancing really fast, and uh, he already had his his valuables um, stashed away, and he was he had very very suspicious um, contacts, especially the same kind of contacts, aristocratic contacts that you see with Martin Bormann uh, in the north of Germany, and Martin Bormann apparently was the spy Vieta who gave away all these secrets um, to the Soviets. And there's a, there's a quote I have here in my notes. It's from Karina Urbach's book. And she says this. Um, she says, uh, those, those aristocratic families 
that were tied to Russia, I mean the old Russia, right? The 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 czars. Um, so these aristocratic families with with con with Russian contacts, they were the earliest to join and support fascism. Uh, meaning the German English houses of Coburg, Hessen, Leiningen, and Hohenlohe, they were all related to what was left of the old Russia, you know, the the czars, the Romanovs, and so um, and and this is an interesting interesting quote because um, it, these aristocrat some of these aristocratic families were not just a spy risk. Um, when it comes to you know Britain, but it was also a spy risk when it came to uh, Russia because uh, Martin Bormann had these connections and he ultimately spied for the Russians. So when you're talking about these aristocrats, it's it's difficult um, to gauge where the ultimate alliances were because apparently some aristocrats like Lord Louis Mountbatten and some others in Britain, uh, some of these aristocrats they had. Um, they had a relationship with Soviet Russia for whatever reason. They uh, they were uh, sort of in bed with the Russians. And so this became sort of a double problem uh, for the Nazis because all these spies were working for, well, some of these spies were working for Britain and or uh, Soviet Russia. And also we've... Um, I think in 2009, um, the the London Guardian ran a headline about Mussolini because... Um, Historians have figured out that Mussolini had actually, in his early days, worked with British intelligence when he was officially a journalist and he was paying people to create, um, you know, chaos and, and friction. He was getting money from British intelligence um, at at the time, and also the the Italian king. He was also uh, somewhat related to the British, and uh, people need to remember when the Romanov family uh, fled Russia. Because this was a large family, most of these people just left left Russia. Um, some of these Romanovs they went to uh, France. Some of them they went to uh, Italy, you know, for that matter, because they had relatives everywhere. Uh, some people, some of them went to Denmark, of course. Uh, so yeah, this was um, this was a nightmarish situation when it comes to intelligence because um, everybody apparently knew the secrets of the Nazis, but the Nazis um, had uh, great problems understanding the secrets of the Soviets. You know, when the, which we're going to talk about this later, of course, um, when the Nazis went into the Soviet Union, they did not know how many troops the Soviets had, how many tanks the Soviets had, so they were going in almost blind. Um, mm -hmm. That, of course... And, and that wasn't only the Germans who were ignorant about them. I think None of the Western surfaces knew much about the Soviet Union. It was a, it was a, after the success of Operation Trust, where so many spies from these countries got arrested and caught because the Russians had fooled everybody in that operation. Uh, it was just too embarrassing. It was too difficult. They didn't know how to get a foothold. And the, and the Russian Soviet counterintelligence methods were just so darn advanced. And they had penetrated the Western services during Operation Trust. And I think that it was very difficult for the Western services to recover from that early defeat. Yeah, and I have some notes here. This is from the this is from the London Guardian and the story in 2009. So uh, newfound documents from the archives uh, shed some light on this. Uh, the year was 1917 and Mussolini was paid, uh, Mussolini was paid by the British MI5. Um, uh, so this is when Mussolini got into politics, so he had uh, British backing. And uh, Mussolini at the time was 34 years old, um, and uh, so he was influencing Italy during World War I. Uh, he was publishing propaganda, Mussolini was also sending out his people that he paid with British money. Um, he was uh, creating some uh, friction to uh, influence and, you know, public opinion. And uh, the money for Mussolini was, uh, the money the money for Mussolini came from Sir Samuel Hoare, a British politician and also MI5 agent in Rome. And he had about 100 British intelligence officers um, at the time at, at that place. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, this was, this was becoming sort of a, a, 
a, a, a network of of crazy proportions. Um, so, for example, uh, Karl Eduard Herzog von Sachsen, Coburg und Gotha, he actually got um, uh, Fritz Fritz Thyssen to to become more involved in the Nazi regime. Uh, Fritz Thyssen, you know, of course, the the big name in steel production, and. Uh, Uh, the Herzog von Sachsen, Coburg und Gotha was also bringing in the banker Hjalmar Schacht and the industrialist Günther Quandt. Uh, the Quandt family is involved in BMW, the car company, or they I think they even owned it at the time or created it. So um, yeah, if, if you if you if you've seen a BMW, that's basically the uh, Quandt family right there. Um, yeah, and and also. Um, And also this this uh, Herzog of Sachsen, Coburg and Gotha, he was involved before the Nazis even took power. Um, they were giving uh, they were giving people cover identities and and giving them a, a safe place to live, and uh, they were ties to the secret organization called Organization Consul, and they were conducting assassinations um, to. Uh, make it possible to take over in Germany. Um, yeah, so uh, these people, we, we, these people were scouting. Be... By the way, these people were scouting different um, candidates for the role mm -hmm. of dictator. So Hitler was just one of several candidates, but they ultimately candidates. decided on on him. Um, as you described, the British trying to um, have appeasement. The the Russians had their own way of viewing Hitler. And they wanted him in power. This is uh, Victor Suvorov's book, Icebreaker, very famous book. I think you got to pay a couple hundred bucks to get a copy of this. Um, it was published in Great Britain. Um, and, and Victor Suvorov was a GRU uh, officer who defected, I think, in 1979, if I'm remembering correctly. He wrote a lot of good books uh, inside the aquarium, inside the Soviet Army. Um, uh, he wrote a lot about Russia's World War III or Soviet World War III plans. Um, but, but this book is really important because when he was educated originally, he was a tank officer in the Soviet army. He participated in the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. But he was really uh, a professional military guy, a Soviet military guy who ended up in the GRU. But he was fascinated by operational art of war and World War II. And he was able to see certain maps that he saw when he was younger, when he was in military school, uh, of the deployments before 1941, the German invasion. And he, this is what got him in the, I showed you his other book, The Chief Culprit. He started to privately collect information for himself. And then afterwards, after his defection, and especially uh, he was able to correspond with veterans of the Second World War because there were things he wanted to put together And this, this first book is quite an interesting research, but then after he wrote this book, his book, The Chief Culprit, it was a massive correspondence. Of course, this book came out in the 80s, massive correspondence with those who were still alive who were in the war that could tell him things. Um, and of course, it was his thesis that not only did Stalin bring Hitler to power and called him the icebreaker. This was Stalin's nickname for Hitler. Hitler was the icebreaker of the world revolution. Yeah. And he talks, of course, about Lenin had the idea that, okay, there was the first imperialist war, which is what they call World War I, but there's going to be a second imperialist war, said Lenin in 1920, and we have to be ready to use that war to expand communism by being on the right side, by manipulating the outbreak of the war, by setting different imperialist powers against each other. And so this was integral to Lenin's strategic thinking in 1920. And it's also, this is actually the first book before Viktor Suvorov, and Suvorov might have gotten some of his ideas for, for it. There's a German version. This is the um, uh, English translation. Ernst Topisch was a German officer in World War II. He was in Sixth Army. He was wounded before Sixth Army was surrounded, so he got out with his life without being a prisoner. Stalin's War was his book. This was written in, in the early 80s. And it is an analysis of grand strategy and diplomacy between Russia and Germany. Um, and, and he was the first one to actually find, amazingly, his research. He spent, he was a, 
a professor in a different field than military history, but he collected data because he always thought there was something funny about the way this war started. And he was the first one to say, look, Stalin and Lenin designed this World War II. They had this as a design. And they had a similar design for a war in the Pacific. So their design for World War II was to set the powers in Europe, Germany and the West against each other, and to have Japan and the United States and China against each other in the Pacific. So it was a similar pattern in both theaters. And these are both, by the way, the Soviet Union goes all the way to the Pacific. So this is very much on their doorstep, just like Europe is, because it's, you know, um, 13 time zones um, and, and so on. So it, 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 it's very important to understand this, this idea. And, and so you, you had something, I think, and I know something about when Hitler came to power, how Stalin helped Hitler become chancellor. Oh, yeah. Could you comment? Well, um, now, uh, for a for a while, um, the Nazi Party was the Nazi Party was in trouble. Now they they did gain a lot in in various elections, but it was just not enough. They had spent millions and millions, and and they got money from all sorts of places. Um, they got money from Sir Henry Deterding, uh, who was um, one of the uh, one of the main stock. Uh, stock owners of the oil company Shell or Royal Dutch Shell, and uh, and uh, this was also, t of course, tied to the the royal family of the Netherlands. Uh, some people may recall uh, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands um, and and his you know family relations to the Nazis. So they got all this money in, but it was never enough. They could not take full power. And the communist movement was also really strong um, in the in the earlier 1930s. Um, so you had the communist party in Germany, with all their contacts to Moscow, of course. And then you had the social democratic party, and they were all they were also very much pro Russia, um, because as we know, the Soviets d did not want any communists out there that were independent or just you know communists that didn't like moscow okay so you had two parties in germany um that were two parties that were pro moscow uh they were very familiar in their uh, ideological uh, view and also you had all this supporter um these supporter circles you had uh, millions and millions of people who were left-wing or even communists so naturally some people thought um stalin would give the order uh, to have a united front, uh, a united left front against Hitler and the National Socialists. But instead, uh, the order was given for the Communist Party to attack the Social Democrats and call them everything under the sun and, and just to not, to not have this resistance um, against the Nazis. Now, of course, S these social democrats were horrified and they talked to their contact people and some of them were even ordered to appear in in moscow and um so th that's when the situation was explained to them they thought we could try a communist revolution in germany but um this this communist system then would not last very long and then th this would would be the last would have been the last chance ever of of taking power so what we're going to do this was Stalin's uh, idea. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, let the Nazis do their thing for a couple of years. They will fall apart. And by that time, uh, a, a true communist revolution will be possible. And, and everything's going to turn out fine. Uh, but of course, behind the scenes, Stalin was, uh, Stalin was betting on a big war in Europe, these European powers would kill each other off or weaken each other, and then the Russians could march in. Now, this has been talked about, for example, in, uh, this was, uh, you can read about that in Robert C. Tucker's book, um, Stalin and Power, the Revolution from Above. Um, this is, um, uh, this, this was pretty clear at the time, so we know exactly who these Germans were, uh, these German communists, what they were thinking what they were told um and of course it all turned out um in in a very very horrific um 
very horrific faction. And then also, there's so many things that people are not aware of in general. There's um, secret training for the uh, German Gestapo, the, the interior secret police. You know, they were trained by some of these uh, Soviets, you know, uh, in, in the 30s. So there was all this training, there was all this support that was then used against all dissidents, you know, left wing or whatever. Uh, in fact, um, I, I, a friend of mine in Moscow who used to hang out in the archive where they keep the Lenin documents, the archive has told him he was discussing this history with him and he said, you know, we, we completely controlled Weimar Germany. You know, the, the Soviet, because their agent networks, the communists had infiltrated, like you say, they controlled the Social Democrats, the communists, they'd infiltrated the Nazi party, they were in the conservative parties. So the communists were there playing in all the political parties in Germany and under Weimar. And so they could make the political outcome they wanted in, in Germany. Of course, that outcome was Hitler comes to power. And of course, they had, it's ironic that the Kaiser in World War I brought Lenin to power, financed the Bolshevik Revolution, brought Lenin in the sealed train through Scandinavia into um, Finland Station in, in uh, Petrograd. And, uh, but, but, uh, and then the, it seems like Moscow then returned, the, the Russians returned the favor by putting Hitler in power in Germany thinking it was going to help them and their strategy. So it's funny how these countries put people in power to help their strategy, but those people don't do exactly what they want them to do. Yeah, I have some more notes on this here. Um, it's uh, So this was 1931. The Communist Party of Germany received the order from Moscow not to uh, pursue a terrorist strategy uh, any longer. The plan was that the Nazi party would the Nazi party would smash the conservative middle class um, and the Nazis would also smash the um, you know the regular social uh, Democrats and and then the communists could take over. Um, there is a Dmitri Manwilski. He was a high-ranking uh, official of the Communist International. He called mm -hmm. Hitler. Uh, he called Hitler the, the what was the what is the appropriate um, translation here? Um, he called him an unwitting uh, comrade of the communist world revolution, right? So mm -hmm. um, he called. Yeah, and he, Manuelski also was very famous for talking about how communism could win by a peace offensive by pretending to be friends with people. He said this in 29 or 30. He said, we're going to have the most tremendous peace offensive ever in history. And everybody's going to believe we're nice and we're wonderful. And then bam. Yeah, because um, the, the Nazis, they, um, the Nazis wanted to create the impression they are, they are somewhat for, you know, conservatives in, in Germany, but the Nazis really hated the conservatives in the, the, the regular conservatives in Germany because they thought these conservatives were lame. They were not willing to do something grand and large and, and have a, a real real revolution, a right wing revolution. And so um, it, there was this was kind of a, the, the goal of the Nazis to destroy this these old circles. But this was also a goal of the communists and Hitler was Hitler was doing the, this job for the communists, basically, wittingly or unwittingly. I, I, I should I should point <clears throat> out Hitler's had this two faces. Hitler had two faces. So when he would go before businessmen and the middle class, he would talk about Jewish Bolshevism and the threat of communism because that's what the middle class was worried about. But when he'd go in front of working men's groups, he would talk about Jewish finance capital. Right, yeah. Jewish bankers, and that that's and and of course the West. So he he used anti-Semitism as a uh, as a way to escape uh, being consistent. So he was only consistent in his anti-Semitism, but in actually what he was telling these different groups, he was telling them what they wanted to hear. Yeah, exactly. So then yeah. you had. Um... So then in uh, 1932, you had the German communist official Erich Wollenberg. He talked directly to Stalin in Moscow. 
And uh, Stalin told him that war was inevitable. But uh, Wallenberg kept arguing and he said that if we have a communist revolution, there won't be a, a large war. But this is the, the point where Stalin ended the conversation. He had made up his mind. And Stalin's advisor, Radek, he said in the same year um, that um, the Nazis... Would, the Nazis would stay in power for uh, two years. And this is as long as the German workers would have to endure a Nazi government. And so uh, so the communists they, so the communists in Germany, they started to, uh, yeah, they, the communists, they, they, they started to help the Nazis and they were trashing the Social Democrats, which was, of course, uh, pretty crazy. And but, um, I mean, Hitler basically eliminated all the other political parties. Yeah, exactly. The, the small conservative and, uh, ones, he let them have, you know, their token, whatever. But basically, the Nazi Party was the ruling party of Germany the, from the Reichstag fire on. Basically, yeah, the uh, the German uh, the German military officer Karl Mayer, um, he talked to. Uh, he talked to Ernst Röhm in 1932, and uh, Röhm told him that um, within the SA, uh, there were a lot of former communists, uh, the former members of the Red Front Warrior Organization. I think that's a, that's a translation here on the fly. So this is, this is strictly from Röhm himself. He tells this other military officer, yeah, about... Um, uh, about one third of the men in the SA were communists, and how many of them were still communists secretly? Well, we don't right, know. Right. We don't know. And so this there is were communists everywhere. And this, is, this, yeah, this is how the Munich policeman um, uh, Heinrich uh, Miller became. You know, it got into the Gestapo. He probably was one of those communists, working class, he was a lower class from one of the lower classes, he probably had these lower class resentments. And it and that's how he probably was recruited early on, a lot of these folks. And I, I should add that um, in terms of the number of communists, you'll notice, I think you made this point before, it was the Deutsches Arbeiters Partei, right, the German yeah, Workers, Workers Party, Party when Hitler joined it, and he changed it to the National Socialist German Workers Party. Yeah. So uh, that was, yeah, I mean, that was a change with the addition of the word socialism in it. Yeah. The uh, British British ambassador in Berlin, Sir Horace Rumbold, um, he was watching the success of um, the Nazi Party uh you know during the elections in 1930 so he was he was seeing how successful this party had become so he's asking the uh prussian uh government official robert weismann he's asking him where do the nazis get their money because they're they're advertising everywhere they have all these big rallies and it, all this burns up money where where does the money come from and the answer was uh russia so this is what uh, Robert Weismann told Sir Horace Rumble that the money came from Russia. So and the, the Russians were actually financing the Nazi party. Correct. Uh, the Berlin newspaper Tageblatt, uh, they published an article on September 13th, 1930. Uh, the headline was Beziehungen zu Moscow, that means relations with Moscow. Um, and this article also posed the question, where did the money come from? And uh, they quoted some documents and they also had, um, they also had some witnesses they quoted. Uh, one of the witnesses was a former Soviet um, ambassador from, from Paris. And uh, they said that um, in, it, you can find in these Moscow archives, you can find um, records of... Um, you can find the records of payments made to the Nazis, you know, Russian, Russian payments uh, made to the Nazis. Um, uh, so then, um, so this, is th just this article, oh, by the way, Suvorov's yeah. And, and yeah, thesis. 
and Hit- Hitler was was not happy with this article in this Berlin newspaper, and uh, he reacted to this article, and uh, and uh, yeah, and, and also Hitler got into a little disagreement with Ernst Graf zu Reventlov. He was an ultra right wing guy. He was always very pro Nazi, and he's been around for a long time. His family is very old. Um, very anti-Semitic guy, uh, Mr. Zure Wendlow, and I also suspect that his family was was running Bormann, but that's really hard to tell. So Hitler gets into an argument with this Count, uh, Count Reventlow, um, because uh, the Count had openly called for, publicly called for an alliance between the Nazis and uh, the, the communists. Um, this was even a publication by the Count in a left-wing newspaper, in a left-wing paper, the Rote Fahne, the Red Banner. Uh, and so uh, this was there, there was some some of these events where um, even communists were joining, um, you know, we were just just taking part in these ultra right-wing events. Uh, and so this is not what Hitler wanted in public that loud at the time. Um, because apparently Hitler, Hitler did not want uh, he did not want people to find out that all this money was coming in from Russia. So when the Count Reventlov was you know uh, schmoozing too obviously with the communists, this became sort of a problem. And so um, Hitler was reacting to this newspaper article, and he was saying, "No, that's that's not what's happening. He's uh, he doesn't know of any of this." Um. And uh, yeah, this was. Um, uh, then we have Stalin biographer Antonov of Sienko. He talks uh, talked about um, agents from the Soviet NK, uh, NKVD. This was Soviet intelligence, and these uh, NKVD guys they were visiting the German Gestapo in 1933, 1943. Uh, so this was kind of the the baseline training on how to set up. Um, this apparatus of surveilling the population, finding the dissidents, torturing dissidents, finding more information. So the Nazis really learned this from uh, the communists. And um, this is also something that we saw many, many times over uh, later in the Cold War when the Soviets would send their people um, to uh, uh, countries in Africa to train them, to teach them how to set up a surveillance state, how to train their own people and terrorize um, the whole population. Um, Yeah, and it's fascinating. This is an important thing for people to understand is that um, I I had, uh, um, if there's a communist document that's current, in fact, that I'll I'll have to uh, read at some point um, uh, that says that... um, there is no communist doctrine or dogma that we follow. Follow, we're flexible, and that we will use any local movement, nationalism, religion, whatever we 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 we're, we will use anything to advance our cause. That anything is is good, you know. Whatever advances our cause, will we will use, um, which is kind of in a way a shocking um, admission. So when people say, oh, the communists would never use the Nazis to advance themselves, that's crazy. No, they do it to this day. They understand this strategy of using anything and everything. And the more evil or twisted that thing might be, the more they want to give it encouragement and help it advance. Yeah, so then in... um in 19, 1936, um, in 1936, uh, Lord Londonderry from Britain, uh, he visits Nazi Germany, and uh, the Nazis really wanted to impress this man. They really wanted to give him a lot of sensitive information, highly classified information, um, information about the planned attacks against Poland and Czechoslovakia. Uh, now, of course, Lord Londonderry was relaying this information to the British, uh, the British government or the you know, British intelligence, and uh, and this was sort of a, a gesture by the Nazis um, to create this trust because um, the British had spread all this conspiracy propaganda about Jews and 
And so the Nazis really wanted to the Nazis really wanted to impress the British and be open about the plans and all that stuff. And so um but in 1936 the German military the German military wasn't ready yet or not as ready yet. And uh, in the same year, 1936, uh, David Lloyd George, former prime minister of Britain uh, during World War I, <clears throat> um, he meets with Hitler at the Backhof, and they're both trying to act real nicely. Um, and, uh, and so this was sort of the, the game that the British were playing, uh, what the British were playing at the time. And Lloyd George said a bunch of very nice things about Mr. Hitler back oh, when he yeah. visited the Berghof. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there was, a, um, there was a scandal in 2015. The, uh, this, this newspaper, The Sun, it's like a, like a tabloid. It's not, not doesn't have the highest reputation. But The Sun was, um, the Sun was publishing still frames um, it, and they were also publishing uh, a video um, on the website. This was uh, 17 seconds of old film uh, film uh, with the the seven year old later Queen Elizabeth. So she was a child back then with her sister Margaret and with the later King Edward the Eighth and uh, and some others. Um, and uh, uh, Elizabeth is doing the Nazi salute and then the others join in and they all do the Nazi salute and the Sun was estimating that this film was shot in 1933 or 1934 at um, the castle Balmoral in Scotland so um, uh, the Duke of Windsor became king for a while uh, King Edward VIII then he uh, resigned because he wanted to marry an American, Wallace Simpson. And uh, yeah, in 1941, even the American FBI became suspicious of them because they both had visited Hitler. So um, even the FBI was was considering this to be, uh, you know, dangerous or weird and mm -hmm. uh, and very suspicious. And, um, and also in 2017, we got some files um, about the Duke and his wife back in the day, they were pressuring or trying to pressure uh, influential Americans so they would then apply pressure to US President Roosevelt to not get involved in a war in Europe. So this is sort of the lobbying, the weird lobbying that was done at the time. So these, this, this, these British, they were trying to influence um, trying to influence the Americans. And Winston Churchill reportedly was very, very angry about, uh, very angry about that. And uh, the, the Daily Mail, this is a newspaper in Britain. Uh, this is in possession of the Lords Rothermere and the, uh, you know, the Rothermere family was also involved in espionage and in the Air Force, uh, by the way. Uh, the Daily Mail in... 1937 was publishing a letter of Hitler um, where he talked about his his planned partnership of these countries Germany and Britain you know the Nordic uh, populations and all that stuff and um, and so this was in the Daily Mail in 1937 just two years before the war so the the ma a major newspaper in Britain publishes the stuff from Hitler where he's uh, lobbying the British uh, the, the, the British population. Yeah, and in fact, Hitler situation. was lobbying the British for an alliance right up through the diplomatic um, negotiations before the invasion of Poland. He wanted the British to commit to an alliance, and he wanted Poland to give up this territory. And of course, it just wasn't happening. He'd already used up all of his political capital by then. And um, that taking this German territory uh, that connected East Prussia to Germany uh, was going to end up being a larger war. And of course, the Wehrmacht was with its doctor, despite the fact that it was really not as strong as people think it was. They didn't have enough artillery for their, um, for their infantry divisions. Uh, their tanks were not the best tanks in the world. 
um, but they had great doctrine and great leaders, great panzer leaders, and their infantry was um, was pretty good. I mean, some of these, some of the divisions, by the way, some of the Landwehr divisions were World War One guys, made up entirely of guys that had fought in World War One, who were by then guys in their forties, right? Yeah. This is twenty years later in their early forties, and these units performed very well. These guys, you know. They could remember everything. They they knew what they were doing, and so the the war was against Poland was very successful because of that. But what's interesting is that the that a lot of people thought that they could just by standing up to Hitler they could dissuade him from attacking, and this is where the British lobbying of Mussolini helped. Mussolini Hitler was expecting Mussolini to go in right away with him at the beginning of the war, and Mussolini came up with the demand. You have to give me all this money. You have to give me all this fuel for my fleet. You have to give me, you have to give me, give me, give me. And Hitler was like, I can't give you all this. I don't have this. So Mussolini said, well, tough luck, pal. I'm not on yeah. your side. I'm just going to be neutral. <sighs> and that almost dissuaded Hitler from starting the war, except there were delegations of British and French in Moscow negotiating to make a treaty with Moscow. That would have made... Hitler in a box, right? If if Moscow had said, all right, we're allied with the Allies, yeah. Hitler would have to said, said, oh, I'm not invading Poland, sorry. That's yeah, suicide. But exactly. then Hitler, then Stalin kicked those delegations out, the French and the British, and invited Molot uh, Ribbentrop, Hitler's foreign minister, to come to Moscow and offered Germany the, the non-aggression pact. Yeah. So, um, so Churchill, um, uh, Churchill was meeting. Churchill was meeting with Ribbentrop in the German embassy in London, and uh, Churchill said that England England had had no interest in Germany ballooning to up to three times the size, and Ribbentrop was um, responding to that that war was inevitable if Britain doesn't. Uh, Play along. So in November of 1937, Hitler uh, tells his generals to get ready for a war. I mean, really get ready for a war. And of course, quite a few generals and others were removed from their posts. So in on February the 4th, 1938, 16 generals were uh, removed and, and retired. 16 generals. Generals and 44 others were uh, placed in a different uh, position. So um, the the war ministry became the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht under uh, uh, General Wilhelm Keitel, and Keitel basically always did what uh, what Hitler wanted. You know, this this became sort of the, this trio: Keitel, Lammers, and Bormann. So they managed access to Hitler. They uh, managed the, inf the flow of information to Hitler, and they were executing his uh, his orders. And so other generals, they thought about killing Hitler at this stage, uh, trying to communicate with the Brits, but no deal or back-channel deal was reached. So in, these in, events In fact, um, Admiral Canaris was involved in this early attempt to overthrow Hitler. And this was during Mu just before Munich. And Hitler was going to go to war against Czechoslovakia, and the German generals thought, this is suicide. The Czech army was a million men. It was strong. It had those good tanks. Um, and they had fortifications. They had their own, like, mini Maginot line type fortified line. And, of course, then you had the French and the British that were, by treaty, obligated to come to Czechoslovakia's aid. This would have been a disaster. And, of course, so Canaris got these German generals to agree to overthrow Hitler. Um, but then Canaris, they said at the breakfast table, the headline was N Chamberlain flies to Munich. And it, it, it just, it, the, he just, he became ill, physically ill Canaris, because it meant they had it, all the ducks in a row. They were ready to get rid of Hitler. And basically Chamberlain by coming to Munich saved Hitler from a coup. Yeah. yeah and then you had, um, then you had uh, Baron William de Rob. He was feeding false information to Alfred Rosenberg. 
he was telling Rosenberg that high-ranking officers in Britain's uh, Britain's Air Force had no intention of um, waging war against the Germans because of Poland. So, uh, uh, so what, once Poland is taken, every, the whole world, you know, has to uh, accept it, and uh, there would be some sanctions against the Germans, maybe a naval blockade and some additional uh, negotiations. And then Hitler was telling his uh, military official, Franz Halder, the French and Brits are just bluffing. So we can't, we can't really be sure how much Hitler was actually believing this. Maybe he was 100% sure, maybe he was 80% sure, maybe he was 60% sure. But he was telling this to Franz Halder, you know, according to his information and all his great espionage, it wasn't really great. Um, he was sure or he was assuring Halder that the the British and the French were bluffing. They would not actually Right. Well, he really war. did believe it. Yeah, Hitler yeah. did believe that they were bluffing. And he believed it because Ribbentrop, who was the dumbest Nazi? I think they did uh, Nuremberg. They took the, they got the IQ, the IQ test of the Nazi leaders, and he tested the lowest IQ of the Nazi leaders. Hermann Göring had the highest IQ. He had a genius IQ, but um, he was he wasn't too bright. And he's the one that convinced Hitler. And of course, he had been German ambassador to uh, the British Empire, to to, to Great Britain, um, and then was made foreign minister. And so Hitler had trusted him in, if you go to the memoirs of Erich von Manstein, the, the, perhaps the greatest German general of the war, in his memoirs, he recounts Hitler had a military conference before the invasion of Poland, in which many of the generals were like, well, we're we gonna end up, France and Britain are gonna declare war on us. You know, this is not good. And Hitler assured them that they were blu- the allies were bluffing. Yeah. He had assured them of that. So, and then there's the famous account, which is related by Hitler's translator, who was in the room. Um, and I forget his name at the moment, but um, it was it was ribbon. It was when the the declaration of war came from Britain in France, the the ultimatum after the yeah. invasion of Poland. Hitler's in the Reich Chancellery. He's with a Goering. He's with Ribbentrop, and he's with his translator. And I forget uh, also. Um, um, Hess was there, and among others, and um, basically the news came that the cable from the, and of course the translator is translating it, I don't know, he's there for some reason, maybe he just met with somebody, um, and it's explained to him that he has so many hours to pull out of Poland, and this declaration of war by France and Great Britain becomes effective, and the world war then begins, and they, the, the account is that Hitler was stunned by this. Yeah. And he looked very angrily to Ribbentrop and said, you told me this wouldn't happen, right? Yeah. Now, the, um, uh, now the, of course, um, there was a bit of, still there was a bit of luck involved because um, in 1946 um, at the Allied Tribunal in Nuremberg, um, we got a statement from General Jodl from the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, um, and he said uh, we would have collapsed uh, during the war against Poland if um, the British and the French had moved against us. Um, so he estimated he estimated 110 French and British divisions, and uh, Germany's uh, Germany's rear was protected by only 23 divisions so there was a uh, bit they, of luck they involved in the that. west wall they had a thing yeah. called the west wall and they were using of course the rhine river as a barrier as well um it's uncertain how successful the french did launch a small attack attempt to go into german territory but this is a very narrow front by modern military standards you only need a small number of divisions to protect because remember unless Holland this was the great fear if Holland and Belgium had joined with Britain and France opening up an attack directly into the Ruhr the undefended part of the of the German West then the Allies would have easily been able to defeat Germany 
But because Belgium and Holland and Luxembourg were neutral, and the British and French didn't think of getting them on their side, or they, I, I don't know why they didn't, um, they could have done this, but they didn't. Um, yeah. Not sure why this de these developments, but but it, there there is another thing. The the French and Germans had a different plan that we should talk about early in the war for defeating Hitler, and that plan involved invading um, Norway, parts of um, Sweden, part that's exposed to the North Sea above Denmark, and I believe Denmark. They were planning to to take this area because the the Swedish iron ore, which came through Narvik in the winter time, that Swedish iron ore was decisive for Germany. They couldn't yeah. have built the tanks and the things they needed without it. And uh, the Allies realized that if they moved, and of course they had they had a plan to invade Scandinavia. And I think, if I'm remembering right, it was in early May they were planning to do the invasion. And of course Hitler preempted this invasion because after he defeated Poland. The next country he went in is he annexed Denmark and he invaded Norway very suddenly, right out from under the British fleet, as a matter of fact, which is yeah. a very peculiar cross-water invasion against the British fleet, and it succeeded. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe you want to talk about that a bit. But the, this, this may be that the yeah. Allies decided to do it this way, and of course, they were just slow on the draw. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a bit of luck involved here and there, too. I mean, the, the clock was ticking even faster after the invasion of Poland, because now the Germans desperately needed the source uh, for iron ore, and they also needed a source for oil. So it, it was clear that things had to move even faster, and Hitler was trying to negotiate again. So he was sending his... Um, Hitler was sending his amateur diplomat uh his name was Dalerus and um but Dalerus returned empty handed even though it was offered to give back um large parts of Poland so they were even offering you know just we just keep the corridor and we're going to give back the rest of Poland as long as the British stay passive but uh no such deal was was actually reached so this no, was also and, and just just meant yeah. to to stall for time basically because even yeah. if um even if a deal had been reached like this this would not have meant the end of the whole story well it was it was i think in the in the British political elite had decided that that they wanted regime change in Berlin they wanted Hitler gone. Yeah. They had determined he was not someone they could do business with. And so they didn't want, and of course, at that point, Britain and France were strong. Why would they want to give up to Germany, uh, give Germany anything? They felt that they could still contain the situation, which they were underestimating Hitler. Um, and of course, Hitler was in a, in a very difficult position because the Germans and French had better tanks, heavier tanks for certain. And they had as many divisions and they had as many aircraft, really, as Hitler did. So there was no real reason to think, just on those numbers alone, that the Western Allies would be defeated by Hitler. And yet, that's exactly what happened to them. And of course, mm. this Blitzkrieg in Norway was extraordinary achievement. And yeah. Hitler did personally organize that invasion. Um, he he came up with uh, the general, the right general, to do it. They met at the Reich's Chancery. They had sandwiches lined out. All the officers were hand-picked for the invasion. And they would meet and do the planning, and they would have their, their sandwiches and their, you know, whatever else they served. Um, and it was an amazing operation. They sailed right through the British because they didn't make a big invasion fleet. They had one ship. Here, one ship there, they, it was all spread out. So that they, they got through the British because the British didn't see a fleet. They just saw these isolated ships here and there. And, and of course, they had their Brandenburg Regiment grabbing air, you know, port facilities and airfields to fly people in. And then they did have, there was an invasion that came right up uh, Oslo Fjord and battled its way up. And I think... Uh, what was the cruiser? They lost a, a, a cruiser or a pocket battleship going up there into uh, 
into Oslo Fjord. That was the stronger, but see, the British fleet didn't come that far east to Oslo Fjord. Right. It never, because of German air control of the air uh, around Denmark, in, in between Denmark and Norway, they had a corridor of air control. And of course, this is what allowed the invasion. It was the superiority of the Luftwaffe and the massing of the planes. And you know who enabled that? Not, not only did Germany, you talked about steel in Scandinavia, the oil, they had made a deal with Romania to supply yeah. them the oil. And they had a deal with Stalin, who supplied the Third Reich with oil and grain. Yeah, and also the, the was it the ball bearings that came from Sweden, I think it was? There was this uh, large corporation that made these precision ball bearings that were needed for uh they were needed for the war i mean all kinds of uh all kinds of equipment was was requiring these these ball bearings so this was this was an important uh, important victory for the nazis at the time but as i said the clock was ticking even faster because um the stalling techniques uh had failed so the british were starting to to land uh their troops the french were getting ready and uh hitler kept telling his people that um it it would only take a bit longer for a new government to form in britain so he was spreading the hope or the wishful thinking that um you know government would change in britain and they the new government would be much more friendly towards um towards the germans um so uh now you you had a situation that that at the beginning looked like a repetition of world war one meaning you had to fight um the French, uh, and you had to fight the British, and uh, and now of course the the expectation was to repeat the old Schlieffen plan, um, just to 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 go in through the north and uh, fight the British and then flood into into France. Um, that was the that was the expectation, but ultimately the officer Erich von Manstein, he uh, he came up with this alternative plan to uh, uh, push with his uh, tanks through the Ardennes um, and he convinced the um, the uh, commander, the Oberbefehlshaber uh, of this Heeresgruppe uh, Gerd von Rundstedt. So they wanted to cut cut off the French, you know, basically push yeah. right into the middle, push right into the it, middle it of was, France. It was this, the Schlieffen plan was, of course, what they did in World War One, where they, the man on the far right, his sleeve brushes the English Channel as they come down and they come in behind Paris with this giant sweep, this giant flanking sweep with a heavily weighted right uh, hook. Um, the von Manstein plan was more subtle it was to move uh, uh, Guderian's panzer group through the Ardennes forest very rapidly to pop out around the area of Sedan, which is just above where the Maginot Line ends. And we should mention the Maginot Line. The French, along their border with Germany uh, and part of Luxembourg, they had this massive fortified line, which is extremely sophisticated and almost impossible to breach from the front, <clears throat> and that they that they were defending their country with. So. Um, then they could concentrate their army in the Low Countries when the Germans came. And of course, the French and British had something called the Dial Plan, which was to mass their tanks and troops in the north and immediately move into Belgium to counter the Schlieffen yeah. movement. Because they thought this, uh, this Maginot Line had guaranteed the Germans would have to repeat the Schlieffen Plan. But here was this clever, this panzer. Nobody had used tanks in mass like this before. Uh, maybe in Poland, you could say, but not where the Allies experienced it. And if he could, if he could break the through at Sedan, just above the Maginot, where the Maginot Line ended around uh, Luxembourg, Belgium, if he could in France, if he could cut up then a sickle cut up to the English Channel, he would trap the advancing British and French armies advancing into Belgium. He would trap them in Belgium, and cut them out of supply from their rear. And this was the, the brilliance of it. Hitler saw the brilliance of this plan, too. Von Manstein was only a colonel at the time, but he's yeah. considered the, the greatest military strategist among the German generals yeah, for I this. Mean, there was, there was, uh, there was uh, skepticism even within the, the military ranks, um, but it ultimately, it ultimately succeeded. Um, mm -hmm. so, then, so, so then the Nazis, uh, the Nazi troops were advancing 
further and further and uh, there was the possibility of completely encircling the British expeditionary force and of course uh, the officers um, were uh, the officers thought it was a, a no-brainer uh, to basically take the entire British uh, expeditionary force but then Hitler gave his famous order to slow down the advance uh, which gave the British the opportunity to escape, you know, the miracle of Dunkirk. And there was even a a, a new movie made um, about this, I think by Christopher Nolan, who was a very suspicious mm-hmm. character. He just won, I mean, Nolan, he just won uh, all these awards for his Oppenheimer movie, which was basically communist propaganda. Um, and he made this uh, Dunkirk movie without mentioning the... Uh, Without mentioning these, these or really showing these uh, these orders that came from Hitler, uh, General von Rundstedt, he was shrugging his shoulders. He stopped the tanks, and uh, he was expecting new orders to come in to finally take the British army. Um, mm-hmm. But um, Hitler was Hitler was stalling and stalling and, and playing for more time, so the British um, could actually escape. And uh, there are many. There are many witnesses that um, talked about this. Uh, for example, um, one of them saw and, and heard Hitler yelling into a telephone at the uh, Reichs Chancellery, yelling into the phone, it's, it's not the plan to destroy the British Empire. We do not want these colonies to fall into somebody else's hands. We want to work with the British. Uh, we don't want to destroy uh, destroy the British. Yeah, Hitler so. was still, even though the British thought Hitler was a pariah and never wanted to work with him, Hitler still somehow didn't see himself, didn't understand how they saw him. Uh, Christa Schroeder, who was in Hitler's command car, she was his lead secretary at the time. Her memoir, she wrote a memoir when she was dying of cancer in the early 80s. She knew an awful lot, and she remembers being in the, in the car in Hitler's uh, command carriage. It was on a train. Um, where Hitler said this exact same thing that you talk about him in the phone. He was explaining how he didn't want to destroy the British Empire. He wanted to let these British troops get away. And there was another military consideration that a lot of historians miss. Panzers could not just drive around all the time and just gas up and keep driving. The tank tracks wear out. The tanks need to be refitted Um, in in that sickle cut. The panzer divisions needed to be resupplied and 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 a lot of the tanks needed to be fixed and looked at and before they went on their next attack so they there was a reason why the german army couldn't immediately move on the british um, because the units that had caught them were panzer units they were motorized and there was there were these logistical considerations um, uh, in, in this. And of course, the other thing was, how would they know that the British could come up with, the British civilians could come up with all their these light craft and and just go across the channel and pick, pick boys up? You know, nobody really, that had never happened before in a war. And there's some, there's a, there's a British movie, I think it's called Mrs. Minerva's War. Um, it was a, it was a, I think it was a war film I think it was even made during the war. It was, a, it was a, about a British family experiencing the war. And, it, and a good part of it was how they pitched in in this operation. And they, the family had a boat. They had a motorboat. And they went and they picked up British soldiers. All these civilian people did this, this rescue of, of the soldiers. And they rescued some French, too. Um, uh, but the French army largely just got left behind. Um, and then, of course, the second phase of the attack, when these panzers got refitted, they just, the, the French were, could not form a strong enough line to stop the Germans. And they just went right into Paris. Yeah. They took out the whole thing. And then it was, nope. what was it, June, whatever, that the, that the, the offensive began on May 10th, by the way, of 1940. And I think was the, was the surrender done on May 27th, May 26th? I don't remember. remember the day? Yeah, and also, I mean, there was, there was also, uh, there, there may have been some secret negotiations uh, going on at the time during this miracle of Dunkirk, um, because um, because of both sides had the 
the capabilities uh, to to uh, use chemical weapons or even biological weapons. I mean, if the British commu had communicated um, their willingness to defend the British islands, I mean, this could have given the impression that um, an invasion of the British islands was just not worth it. Because um, if, um, if the landing zone was contaminated with anthrax or poison gas, I mean, Hitler was traumatized by poison gas from World War I. So, I mean, this, this might have just changed the German calculation because if, if um, in theory, you could do it, you could achieve uh, an invasion, but the losses would be pretty uh, significant and and you know there, there are many reasons probably that went into this um, into this um, uh, continuous seeking for an alliance with the British and also of course the racial the racial um, uh, ideology you know the Nordic the Nordic peoples that shouldn't destroy each other and uh, of course the conspiracy propaganda because according to the Nazi view, uh, Britain was uh, somehow dominated by a few Jewish people, as well as America was supposedly controlled by a few Jewish people. And uh, and so th there was still this hope that you can get rid of the Jews, have a new government in Britain, and, and the alliance would stand and everything yeah, would Hitler be Yeah, Hitler had glory. this, his anti-Semitism did not serve him well in understanding Britain. And the idea that the Jews control the United States or Britain is laughable, especially in those days. It just wasn't true, uh, as you've pointed out before. And this is a, a huge problem in Hitler's understanding Great Britain and understanding the West and understanding also how um, how they saw him as a monster from just the Kristallnacht. I mean, the Western countries believed in freedom. Hitler did not. They believed in honest dealing and, and Hitler was a murderer. Hitler had people murdered. Hitler was not honorable. Um, and, and he broke his word. And of course, this, you know, we know that Western politicians are perfect, but Hitler was rotten in a way that even they were appalled by him and realized they couldn't trust him or deal with him. Yeah. Uh, and they couldn't even understand him because he made these crazy decisions like invading Poland and starting a world war when they told him, look, we're going to be at war with you. You don't want to do this. They were trying to dissuade him. Yeah. And he wasn't dissuaded. I mean, which the Brits, of course, goes back to yeah. the the syphilis thing. Maybe you know the the British had hundreds of years of experience of running an empire and you know working with other nations and just just carefully deciding when to go to war and how to go to war. So the the Brits were experienced, but the the Nazis were these 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 people that came from nowhere. I mean, the leadership of the Nazis. There were these nobodies to the British. And um, and and it's it's typical for a new regime. They are so over the top, they overestimate um, their own understanding of, of these matters. And um, so this was a, a a very significant disconnect. Now in Britain yeah. at the time, uh, in Britain at the time, a lot of a lot of a lot about Britain is secret. It's it's always very secret. It's They're hard to understand the secrets to this day. Yeah, and it's They're hard to understand. To it's hard day. to understand who was making the decisions and who was influencing whom. Now, for example, um, and and of course Hitler used this this secrecy from the British um, because Hitler was constantly lying to his own people. You know, everything's going to be everything's going to turn out fine, but it was really hard to determine who was making the decisions in Britain. Now, uh, for example, Prime Minister Chamberlain was not in the loop about the secret reports from Bletchley Park where they decrypted these um, these Nazi communications, the Enigma uh, encryption. Uh, but Churchill was in the loop. So Churchill was allowed well, to know this, but not Chamberlain. Yeah. Now Churchill is from well, a very old family. He's from the uh he is. he's connected Duke to the Marlboro, Marlboro the Marlboro clan. Mm -hmm. And this the, the Marlboros, they even went back as far as I think the the, the early seventeen hundreds when they uh, defended the territory of Hannover, the mini kingdom of Hannover on German soil yeah. for these Welfen uh, kings back back then. So this well, is the how first far Churchill they go back. Well, the first Churchill that was the Duke of Marlborough uh, was the one who basically stabbed um, King James II in the back in the Glorious Revolution and caused his overthrow and became the Duke of Marlborough as a consequence and, and was considered one of the greatest soldiers of that age. 
Um, what's interesting is t it is it was a very unfortunate for Hitler's attempting to make peace with Britain that um, on May the 10th, the day that the the German offensive into France and the Low Countries started, Churchill was made prime minister and Chamberlain was forced out. Um, and they created a coalition government which also allowed socialists to come to power with Churchill in uh, in Great Britain. And um, it was due largely to the failure in Norway because as you recall I had said that the Western strategy of the Western Allies was to stop the iron ore to get into Narvik especially and to get into Norway and the Germans beat them to it and the Battle of Narvik went against the British and the whole Norway thing it was just a, a decisive by the time you know the the invasion of Norway to give people the time line April 10th it's a month before the invasion of of the Low Countries in France which was May 10th so you had a whole month of the Germans winning in this Norway campaign in Scandinavia in, in and, and so by that time, Churchill is completely discredited as a leader. His leadership is not wanted. And Churchill then becomes prime minister on the 10th. And of course, you have this, this terrible situation. They did a movie about this too, about Churchill first becoming prime minister and going through the fall of France and the Dunkirk thing, how dark this was. Because Britain's army was basically, the whole British army was defeated. Yeah. You know, in June of 1940, in May June 1940, and and it was uh, they had to leave all their equipment behind on that on those beaches, and they did lose a lot of guys. And the Luftwaffe tore the RAF apart, and tore the French Air Force apart. And it was largely not because of battles in the air; it was the integrated flak, the anti-aircraft guns of the German divisions. The Germans had the 88 anti-aircraft guns. And they just, the numbers of Allied planes were just stripped out of the sky. And the Allied, so the Allied air forces were not effective. And the Western ground units didn't have the same kind of air defenses, which yeah, made so, them vulnerable. <clears throat> so Hitler was spreading the optimism. He was more or less lying to his own people again. He told them it's, it's going to turn out really, really well. Um, Churchill wouldn't last very long. Lloyd George would replace him soon. The Duke of Windsor would, you know, return to the throne and all that. France was beaten. So Hitler, Hitler lied to his own people that the war in and of itself was more or less over now. Um, and so yeah. it, it would take a while to um, secure his grandiose successes and to build on that. And his uh, successor as a dictator, his successor at some point in the distant future, uh, his successor would then deal with Russia. Now, that, of course, was a lie. And, and the British knew that, that that was a lie. The British, uh, in British intelligence officer Winterbotham knew from his sources that Hitler, uh, Hitler wanted to attack Russia in 1941 without uh, attacking Britain before that i mean without really taking over britain before that uh and, and uh, but hitler did toy with operation sea line invading britain he yeah, really the, did he wanted to war, do it at one point the yeah. air the air force um, war yeah and, yeah, this and was, it was he was tricked by churchill by the way because they were winning the battle of britain they were crushing the raf and then the british bombed a german city i forget which one and hitler got mad at these British bombing, uh, and so he thought this was against the rules of war, and so he decided to retaliate rather than continuing the destruction of the RAF. He sent his planes in to bomb London, and this changed the war. It raised the British morale because it was a monstrous act to bomb London, and it also and it, galvanized it, the it, Americans. It, this was uh, it, yes, it galvanized Americans who were sympathetic to the British. It made him look like a bully. And of course, he what was it in the big sports plaza in Berlin? He gave the 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 "We're coming" speech or "I'm coming" speech. I think it was a "We're we are coming" speech, you know, where he was going to get revenge for the RAF bombing places in Germany. Um, this was a terrible. This was a big strategic mistake, and Churchill goaded him into it. Yeah, because if the, the RAF was just fighting with the with yeah. the Luftwaffe without this stupid bombing, 
the Luftwaffe was picking them apart. The the British S SIS, the Secret Intelligence Service, um, had a a campaign in a covert campaign in America to uh, lobby for America to uh, to join the war at some point. Um, of course, and um, yeah, and of course, um, Hitler was Hitler was still trying his um, his uh, you know his own campaign. So, for example, you had the Haushofer clan, um, the the elder Haushofer. He was this geopolitics academic, and he was um, uh, you know he he had this also had this idea of a deal with Britain, and the younger um, the the younger Haushofer. Um, uh, he was called Albrecht Haushofer. Um, the the younger one, he was very close to Rudolf Hess, who was most likely uh, gay, uh, and uh, and so Haushofer was traveling a lot to London, and he had a close tie with the uh, the Marquis of Clydesdale, and maybe he was romantically involved with the Marquis of Clydesdale. This was almost treason at that point. Um, this marquis became the Duke of Hamilton, and uh, the and and the Duke of Hamilton, of course, was uh, also playing the Nazis uh, quite a lot. And uh, it was this Hamilton. Uh, it was exactly this this Hamilton, whom uh, Rudolf Hess wanted to travel to in his uh, modified airplane so rudolf hess was one of the highest ranking people i mean he, he didn't have a number a three big official... i think he was yeah. number three in line of succession he was uh, he was kept out of the Gary. public he was kept out of the public at some point but he was still very very close uh, to to the nazi leadership and and rudolf hess was always very very close to hitler himself so at some point rudolf hess uh tells his 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 guys to um to uh, add some fuel tanks to his uh, his airplane, a small airplane, so he could travel to Britain and uh, meet the Duke of Hamilton. But um, because uh, Rudolf Hess thought he had these powerful friends in Britain, but of course, Rudolf Hess was then just arrested and imprisoned for a very very long time, and uh, it's not even clear if. Uh, the Supposedly prisoner. committed suicide in what, 1987 or 88? Yeah, and at some point during the um, the incarceration or imprisonment, um, some people looked at the files and um, his um, his medical files were lacking a wound that was that, that he had sustained earlier. So there was some speculation. Yeah, a British doctor in 1971 did X-rays of his chest and. F in World War One, he had been shot in the chest, and there was no evidence of that wound. And yeah. so this British doctor said, "This is not Rudolf Hess." Exactly. So, him. so Hitler was well. Yeah. So Hitler was then lobbying his generals um, about the big war against Russia, Operation uh, Barbarossa. Of course. And, and we should uh, start with that next week because we've exactly. got more than three hours. <laughs> so exactly. We need to stop. Exactly. Because we've this is covered this the, is really the, the this beginning is really of the, the war. Yeah. We've the, covered it pretty well. Yeah. But this is now this really. is then this is then the big phase and the big turn of the war once the uh, the, the Operation Barbarossa against the Soviet Union began. And this is also then when, you know, the, the United States uh, entered the war. And um, this is and also when we should ta we should talk about how the uh, how this breakup of this wonderful partnership, <laughs> wonderful yeah. between Hitler and Stalin happened, why they fell out, why their alliance didn't hold. We should talk about that next time too. And yeah, and also the this phase of the war then is when the espionage really really became a problem for the germans uh not just with martin bormann but also with others because um we know from the intercepted um communications that um there were several high place sources and they all had code names one of the code names was werther that's probably martin bormann and they all sent material to one guy he sent it to another guy and and he had these radio operators and they radioed this to the soviet union uh very very uh high high quality the, they material radioed it through the red orchestra the rote capella yeah. 
exactly and so that was that was probably one of the biggest if not the biggest intelligence failures in recorded human history um and uh this is when it all came all came crashing down because the the nazis they uh they had already failed in terms of intelligence. I mean, they had the, the failure was already there even before the war even began, but then it became sort of the, one of the deciding factors in the war. And this is what annoys me greatly about these um, regular documentaries and the, the regular history books, because um, they, all, they make it all about the tanks and Hitler's grandiosity and the, the, you know, the guns and all that stuff, but there was so much more stuff involved. But the Russians, I mean, when the war ended, I mean, the Russians probably made sure that certain information was buried forever and nobody was supposed to talk about it. Because oh, yeah. um, if you if, if somebody had published this stuff after 1945, this could have led to not just a diplomatic incident, but maybe a, a Soviet invasion of, uh, you know, Western Germany, for example. And so this information is is incredibly sensitive. But um it tells us a lot about how the Russians operate and still operate to this day. You know, you and I, we talked about the uh, the Putin interview of Tucker Carlson when uh, Putin explained uh, some very, very bizarre uh, concepts in terms of that history. I mean, Putin blamed um, the the Poles. Well, Poland, he blamed Poland, he blamed, for, he blamed World Poland for World yeah. War II and he uh, he had his, had his own interpretation of, um, you know, the... Uh, the, the great patriotic war and and you know the the deal the uh, Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. So, pe- if people understand what happened in World War Two, you know the the secrets of World War Two, they can more accurately judge the way Russia is uh, Russia is operating. Um, yeah, operating because Russia's today. behavior not only is Russia's military failures in the beginning of World War Three, if this is the beginning, similar to the failures in World War Two. And we should mention the Winter War uh, in Finland as well. Uh, but the intelligence, the strategy of creating a larger war, of catching the West by surprise, by being better armed than the West or ready for certain kinds of warfare, um, it's all very similar. It, only now China is the partner of Moscow's partner yeah, rather isn't than this, and isn't this an, Yeah, and isn't this an interesting interesting parallel we talked about in this episode we talked about the appeasement and uh sort of the the intelligence operations that w- w- they were tied into the appeasement and the lobby campaign you know soviet uh, intelligence uh, lobby campaigns in america to stay out of the war and now we have the war in ukraine and we have this this you know lobbying going on everywhere telling people to abandon ukraine and it's all going to turn out fine and nato has this magic button to push and everything's going to be peaceful um but if you know once russia in its in its um long-standing alliance with china once they make the decision for war it there's going to be a war uh, and so mm-hmm. NATO, NATO cannot stop this. America cannot stop this. Abandoning Ukraine will not stop this. No, it won't, because these are they, what we find out when we read Ernst Topish and we read Viktor Suvorov. This World War II plan of Moscow went back twenty years before the war started. That's how far advanced. And so, yeah. when we understand this is the way. The leaders of Russia think about strategy and prepare a year. You know, if you know what you're going to do 20 years from now, you know what you have to do now. Whereas exactly. in the West, they're thinking, oh, what do we need to do for next year, not 20 years from now? So there's a lot of advantage that they get and also disadvantages from playing it that way. But it's it's we're very naive in the West. And understanding this history of World War II, it, it gives you the keys for understanding what's happening now. Because it really is part of the same story with part of the same, you know, cultures and groups of people. I mean, all the people that are running Russia today are just the grandchildren and great grandchildren of the people that were running it, you know, 80 years ago. And also people need to understand that um, as just as we covered it in in this episode, um, Hitler was Hitler was lying to his own people. Hitler was, was lying to the population. He was always telling people, it's just going to be one more step. 
and and that's it and then maybe there's one more step maybe another step so this happened in stages and uh um you know sometimes countries they will initiate a war and they calculate that even in the event of not having a decisive victory they still may get a uh you know a, a deal they still can settle under favorable circumstances so they they uh, they um conquer you know that much and then they give part of it back but they're still left with gains and so this is the same mm-hmm. logic that that we might see from russia where they calculate you know if we go on like this with no big war uh, without China involved, if we go on like this, we won't have a real empire in 30 or 50 years. You know, we can't yeah. compete with yeah. America. So we need to do something now. And even if it's not going to be a totally de- totally decisive victory, we're still going to be left with a sizable gain. And and that may be yeah. just the, the cynical uh, choice to start a war. Because some people and, and still the, believe wars are either decisively lost or decisively won, but there's so many shades yeah. of, of gray in between. The, the advantage that the that the Chinese and the Russians have today that Hitler didn't have is that Hitler was one guy. His whole movement was kind of centered on on one person. And that's always a problem because what happens if something happens to that one person, like he gets sick? The other thing is that they don't, because it is not based on one person, they don't have to do get everything done in the lifetime, the short lifetime of one person. Yeah. They can think generations ahead, and I was a little wrong in saying it was the grandfathers. A lot of times it was, but Putin's father fought in World War II, yeah. right? So it's not that far removed from – so the leaders that are his age in, in Russia, many of them, their fathers fought in World War II. So it's not that far removed far from them, yeah. exactly. right? Because Putin's 71. His father fought in that war. Um, so – yeah, we, we have to remember that uh, institutions and cultures don't change that much in one generation, right? Yeah, and also, but, I two. mean, Putin was, um, uh, af- after the war, Vladimir Putin had to grow up in, you know, destroyed, in his destroyed home city, you know, his hometown. And, Absolutely. Uh, and so this was, he, he was not, he was not a... Uh, uh, a conscious adult in the war but he had to grow up in the aftermath of the war and that influenced him and my own father he was uh i think he was born in 1943 so he grew up in the aftermath which was not as financially difficult or or uh, you know this was not exactly comparable to to putin's uh, childhood but still uh, on a human you know on a human scale you know in the human dimension people were ruined you know mentally absolutely shredded and that also uh, made childhood very very difficult and so this uh, is something imagine that imagine influenced- you are starving everything's in ruins there's no work there's you know everything is destroyed yeah it's terrible yeah and there's also yeah. the the element the element of revenge and i i t- I, t- I, t- I told that people many times that um in terms of uh in terms of Vladimir Putin, I mean, he basically, Putin swore revenge against the Germans and, and all the Western all the Western people because uh, he, even when he was a child, he wanted to join the KGB in order to become uh, a, a, a true in- foreign intelligence asset, infiltrate the Germans and just take them over because he watched this, uh, I think it was a television program or a movie series, The Shield and the Sword, which turned these little children on to to strive to become an intelligence officer and i think in the story that um that putin liked so much um in that fictional story the main character actually does infiltrate germany and and become an well there's 17 i think putin also was being compared to sterlitz in 17 moments in spring isn't that it i've watched it it's a popular soviet tv series from uh, the early 70s, I think, which is really beautifully done. And it's about a uh, intelligence, high-level intelligence, German SS intelligence official who is a Soviet agent. Yeah. And it's it's they got Walter Schellenberg and Heinrich Mueller are characters in the story, actually. Um, but it's 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 quite and, – and, and, of course, Sterlitz, if I'm remembering the name of the character right, he's um, – He's a hero of the young Vladimir Putin. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is a, this is somebody that Putin wants to become. So Putin learns German, yeah, right? He learns exactly. the German language, exactly. and he goes to work as a KGB officer in Germany. Yeah, and from yeah. from Putin's perspective nowadays, he has all these weapons. You know, the NBC weapons, the uh, the 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 cyber capabilities, and just the sabotage capabilities, and all this in intelligence infiltration of of Germany nowadays. So, from his perspective, he's just you know he's chomping at the bits. He just wants this thing to happen, yeah. and he has all these opportunities. And I think many people don't even understand what his opportunities are. You know, what his window of opportunity ultimately is. Um, or so how I much think, this World War II thing just weighs on him is part of who he is. Yeah, yeah, it's his identity. Yeah, yeah, it's become his his identity. And and I mean, people need to remember his his brothers died, his parents almost died. I think one of his parents was considered dead, but then uh, was was discovered to be still alive or barely alive. So I think they, the mother, they almost, they, they already carried her away on a, on, on like a, a, a wooden board stretcher because they thought she was dead. And uh, his father almost got killed many times. You know, this was, uh, yeah. it's personal. It's really, really personal. And, um, uh, and that's where the, you know, this, this grand mythology comes from of the white Western people as the devil, you know, Uh, going back to Alexander Nevsky, then the Nazis, you know, the Teutonic Knights, then the Nazis. And now the comparison is always NATO is the new Nazis. You know, this was subtly and not so subtly in many documentaries and many propaganda puff pieces, even in, on German mainstream television. You know, this one guy, this st former star journalist, Hubert Seipel, who was caught taking Russian money... He was considered a star journalist. He put out this documentary and he was telling people, well, the Nazis did invade, you know, Putin's hometown. And then they show some judo footage of Putin and then they sort of talk trash about NATO. And in the minds of the audience, these two things are connected because nobody cares about the judo footage. If you combine these other things, then NATO looks just like the Nazis. And of course, that's where the The narrative comes from, you know, NATO wanted to get into Ukraine and NATO then wanted to attack Mother Russia. So it's it's yeah. almost like a, it's almost like a, like this um, never ending this never ending paranoia of of and and feeling of revenge. And I mean, if you know, we we will talk a lot about Stalin in the next episode. And Stalin was very very vindictive. I mean, once he would see you as an enemy he would absolutely destroy you and this when i mean this behavior was part of who stalin was this never changed so by appeasing yeah. stalin you don't change stalin and by appeasing putin no. apparently you don't change putin uh, as well no you don't well i want to thank everybody for being with us uh, this is uh, we might have to do three parts for world war ii um But this has been great discussion of World War II and how it relates to what we're going through today. And um, I'm Jeff Nyquist. I'm in the United States. Uh, JRNyquist.blog and my books are on Amazon, uh, The Fool and His Enemy. Um, and, uh, and with me has been uh, Alex Benish. He's got books on Amazon. I think you have some new books out in English now. Exactly, yeah. And, uh, and so go visit our sites in... Uh, on Amazon and get the books and we'll see you in our next episode.